The committee reports progress. We will now move to consideration of the Restoring Territory Rights Bill 2022. The committee is considering the Restoring Territory Rights Bill 2022. The question is that the bill stands printed. Is there a senator that wish, wishing the call? Uh, senator Napa Chipper Price. To uh, move the amendments one and two on sheet 1764 by leave together. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator. Thank you. The purpose of the, of the Restoring Territory Rights Bill 2022 is to amend the Australian Capital Territory Self-Government Act of 1988 and the Northern Territory Self-Government Act 1978 to remove the provisions currently preventing the territories from passing legislation which would allow for voluntary assisted dying. The bill would not legalise VAD in either of the territories, but rather would allow the legislative assemblies of the ACT and the NT to pass laws allowing for VAD. Despite what the Labor Northern Territory and Federal House of Representative members have portrayed of me publicly, I do support the bill and am doing my job, which they should note how, how to better do themselves, in making a bad bill better for the territory. I'll say this again, I absolutely support the rights of Territorians. The proposed amendments drafted by the parliamentary clerk have been developed to ensure that the exact restraints that are currently operative in state law are applied in the Territory because we have some of the most vulnerable communities and people in Australia. For those that don't get to see what's going up, in the, going up in the Northern Territory, in the last week, police have disposed of 229 litres of alcohol. 168 people have been taken into protective custody. The Northern Territory Labor government is too busy protecting their own parliamentary convicted pedophiles than protecting life. Alcohol-related crime and violence is out of control. The federal Labor member for Lingiari and Solomon should hang their heads in shame. Both have publicly called for the CLP to disendorse me because I'm doing my job in the Senate by making a bad bill better, misleading Territorians of my actions on this bill, not supporting a bill in a current form and proposing amendments that already exist right across Australia is doing my job to scrutinise a bill for the betterment of Territorians. There seems to be so much unease about me speaking the truth on what's going on in the Northern Territory. And in relation to this bill, no states across Australia allow access to assisted dying for those under the age of 18. This proposed amendment ensures this applies in the Northern Territory. The New South Wales Voluntary Assisted Dying Act of 2022, Division 4, Part 2, Clause 16, states a person is not eligible for access to voluntary assisted dying merely because the person has a disability, dementia or a mental health impairment within the meaning of the Mental Health and Cognitive Impairment Forensic Provision Act of 2020. Those with mental illness and those with disability can still access the schemes if they meet other criteria under state law. So if it is so good, and good for these other states, why is it not good enough for the territories? There are those that think this might be a radical reform. I can tell you now it's not a radical reform 
to ensure that children don't have access to voluntary assisted dying. This does occur in some Scandinavian countries, and in Canada, a person with a mental health condition and disability can access their assisted suicide scheme even without a terminal condition. Why does Senator Pocock oppose an amendment that provides additional safeguards for children, you have to ask, those with a disability and mental health conditions? Why is he seeking to erode protections for vulnerable persons in the territories? The Victorian Voluntary Assisted Dying Bill of 2017 provision states that a person is not eligible for access to voluntary assisted dying only because the person has a disability, within the meaning of the section 3.1 of the Disability Act of 2006. The Victoria Voluntary Assisted Dying is only for people who are suffering from an incurable, advanced and progressive disease, illness or medical condition who are experiencing intolerable suffering. The condition must be assessed by two medical practitioners to be accepted to cause death within six months. There is an exception for a person suffering from a neurodegenerative condition where instead the condition must be expected to cause death within 12 months. Voluntary assisted dying is only available to Victorians who are over the age of 18, who have lived in Victoria for at least 12 months and who have decision-making capacity. To be eligible for voluntary assisted dying, they must be experiencing suffering that cannot be relieved in a manner the person considers tolerable. In Victoria, mental illness or disability alone, which is what I have provided in this amendment, are not grounds for access to voluntary assisted dying. But people who meet all other criteria and who have a disability or mental illness can still access the service. New South Wales was the last state to pass similar legislation. Some are not confident there are enough safeguards for people with mental health issues. So this is a lesson learnt that the Australian government does have a responsibility to ensure vulnerable people are protected. The amendment is simply saying that you cannot solely, and I emphasise solely because there are a number of measures that one must meet to be eligible, use the basis of having a disability like autism to access the provision of euthanasia or assisted dying. Again, I don't take my decisions lightly. I come from a part of this country where we have some of our most, most vulnerable Australians. I will emphasise the fact that there are vulnerable people in communities who will, who will think, because there is often not enough consultation and education in this area, and I would, I would ask that the Territory Government, whatever Territory Government decides to legislate for this, do the right thing and do the consultation to alleviate fears on the ground of vulnerable Aboriginal people who will think that if they enter into a hospital and they are unwell, they might be given a needle and killed. Because I can tell you now that there are vulnerable people who think this, where I come from. There is a lot to consider with this bill. But my amendments are fairly straightforward, and I hope that I can, um, that I can get the support of my colleagues in this chamber, right through this chamber, to be able to support these amendments in ensuring that our vulnerable people in the Northern Territory are protected. Thank you. Uh, Senator Scar had indicated. I'll give the call to Senator Gallagher. If, well, and then I noticed I, okay. Senator Scar had indicated he wanted to oh, speak, okay. but if it's, okay. if it's for the order of yep. understanding where everyone sits, mm. yeah, sure. it's a, I'll give you the call. And then I'll give Senator Scar the call. And I note Senator O'Sullivan wants the call. Thank yeah, you. Okay. Just Thank you, Chair. The whole room wants to call, so we'll yep, just um, room. We'll, take, we'll play it by Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, and I uh, welcome the opportunity to speak on the amendment uh, by uh, from Senator Nampi Jimpa Price. Um, and I accept um, that you have not taken this decision lightly. I think it's been a very respectful debate in this place, um, and I'm sure that that will continue um, as we reach the final stages of this bill. Just before I get to the amendment, can I acknowledge uh, in the chamber that we have in the gallery the Chief Minister of the ACT, 
Andrew Barr, um, Minister Tara Chain, our former Chief Minister of the Northern Territory, Marshall Perron, um, thank you for being here. Um, created history and, in a sense, <laughs> set off the concertina of um, legislation that we are currently here um, trying to repeal this evening. Um, also to Andrew Denton and Dr Swan from Go Gently, who are here, and some of the supporters of the reform and the repeal of this legislation, and also to a friend of mine, Gina Pincus, who has lobbied very strongly across the community for this legislation to be repealed. Uh, if I can go to the amendment, um, I think, in a sense, um, the senator who moved them identified the issue that, that we're trying to deal with here, which is that this parliament or this uh, this parliament should not be the place where we are looking for safeguards and for running, um, you know, or putting in place restrictions uh, on the job that we are wanting the, the territory legislatures to have the power to do. So I, I am speaking against the amendment uh, because the bill that's before us is a repeal of a law which prevents those legislatures from determining this matter for themselves. That's, that is the sole, single and only purpose of the legislation that's before us, is to get rid of the constraint on those parliaments from being able to debate that themselves. I think, in the, and I, ha, I know and I accept that people feel very strongly about this and think the Commonwealth should have some control. Um, I disagree with that. Uh, but also, the way this amendment is drafted is extremely broad. So, in the sense that um, we are trying to place restrictions, for example, on um, people with a disability, um, then that is a very broad definition. In a sense, in a sense it, I think if this amendment was to pass, it would render anything that the Territory legislatures did ineffective. ineffective. So it's, a, it's in a sense an anti-repeal amendment. And I, I'm, you know, I have no doubt it comes from a good place, but I'm trying to explain to you that the bill that's before us tonight is about getting rid of constraints on the Territory legislatures and leaving it to them to determine. And when you look at the state jurisdictions that have put in voluntary assisted dying legislation, um, they have safeguards in place. They go through a process of consultation. They have ethics processes. They have oversight. They have safeguards. And it's appropriate that those legislatures do that job. Our job here tonight is to get rid of the constraint that exists for only two jurisdictions, the ACT and the Northern Territory, whose citizens are currently now not allowed or not afforded the same rights as citizens of every other jurisdiction, and their parliaments are constrained. They are democratically elected parliaments. They are mature parliaments. They are, uh, they are held accountable by their communities. They face elections. Um, you know, they are, it is more than reasonable that these parliaments be allowed to do this for themselves. So, on the grounds that the amendment effectively tries to anti-repeal a repeal bill, um, I won't be supporting it. But even on the way the amendment's drafted, if it got up, it would mean that those parliaments would, in effect, not be able to to put in place a voluntary assisted dying um, regime, which is up to them whether they do that. We, our job is to get out of the way and let them have the same legislative responsibilities and powers as the parliaments of New South Wales, Victoria, Tasmania, Queensland and WA and South Australia. Senator Scar. Thank you, Deputy President. Uh, I want to focus on a phrase which Senator Gallagher um, made, said in the course of her remarks. And that was, and I think everyone listening to this debate needs to carefully reflect on this phrase. The amendment is coming from a good place. And it is coming from a good place. And Senator Nempajimpa Price is showing a great deal of courage in terms of moving these amendments and is doing so solely, solely because she cares about the most vulnerable people 
in the Northern Territory. And every single person listening to this debate should sincerely acknowledge and respect and give respect to my colleague, Senator Nampajimpa Price, in terms of her uh, stand in relation to this issue. And when this debate is done, when this debate is done and all of us in this place have respectfully put forward our comments, I dearly hope, I dearly hope that the position adopted in good faith, and sometimes it's very difficult to balance all the competing considerations in this regard, I dearly hope that we can move on from this debate and the fact that we have different views being expressed in the course, in the course of this debate within, in this chamber is what makes our democracy strong. And we should then move on. And there should be no recriminations. There should be no looking back at the positions people have adopted in good faith. They should simply be respected. They should simply be respected. In terms of the amendment, I just want to make a few quick points. Um, the first is this, that uh, as a Queensland senator, I read deeply in relation to the experience in the Northern Territory. Uh, and I was um, particularly moved, and I spoke about this in the, in the second reading speeches, an article which was written by Chips McAnulty in relation to the laws um, that had previously been adopted by the Northern Territory. And the title of that article was Right Law, Wrong Jurisdiction. And Senator Dodson has referred to that article in the course of his debate. The fact of the matter is the ACT is very, very diff different from the Northern Territory, extremely different in many, many respects. I don't presume uh, to, to want to stand in this place and, and, and say to the parliamentarians in the Northern Territory what they should or sh shouldn't do, but I have a responsibility as a senator in this place um, to consider those facts. And I think it is on the record that there are particular issues in relation to the Northern Territory. And I dearly hope whatever direction the Northern Territory takes, it reflects on those previous experiences, um, which did cause me deep concern. In relation to the issue of disability, I have previously raised in this point that the United Nations Special Reporter in relation to the rights of the disabled has written to the Canadian government raising concerns about their legislation, raising concerns about the availability of medi medically assisted uh, dying for people with a disability. And I've spoken about the experiences of Canada of people with a disability being approached in hospitals even by an ethics manager and being asked to reflect on the cost of their medical treatment. And that causes me deep, deep concern. Deep concern. Because I think Canada, it should be seen as an analogue for Australia, an advanced country uh, with a system of human rights recognition. However, that is the reality. That is the reality. I heard the story of a veteran who was suffering from gross dep chronic depression ringing a helpline and then being told that perhaps he could access medically assisted dying. And I dearly, dearly hope we don't see those sorts of manifestations occur uh, in, in the Northern Territory, the ACT or any other jurisdiction in this country. But the reality is there are issues. There are issues with respect to how the law is being put in practice in Canada. And that's why I believe these safeguards, uh, from my perspective, make sense. Um, as Senator Nampajimpa Price has said, they're adopted uh, in other states. Um, I don't think it's particularly uh, unclear, to be frank. Um, I can see a difference between a person who, who suffers uh, an egregious illness like cancer, etc., as opposed to someone um, who is suffering um, or who has a disability. I can, I can recognise that difference on the face of it. I don't think, I do not believe, I sincerely do not believe that this amendment, these safeguards, would, would render any Northern Territory legislation nugatory. I, I simply don't believe that's the case. I do not believe that's the case. Um, so I'm happy to uh, uh, rise and support my good friend, Senator Nampajimba Price. And I ask everyone to reflect on Senator Gallagher's words that this amendment comes from a good place. And once this debate is finished, I dearly hope we can just move forward. Thank you. Honourable Senators, I, I notice Senator O'Sullivan, so I'm going to move clockwise around the chamber out of, out of fairness. Senator O'Sullivan. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, I don't seek to detain the, the Senate long. I know we still have a fair bit to get through tonight. Um, 
but uh, I, I do rise. And I just before I, I guess continue, I'd really say what I've, I said during my second reading speech that uh, I do respect the way that this Senate has undertaken this debate. Uh, everyone, including what we just heard there from Senator Scar uh, and Senator Gallagher before, uh, everyone has really engaged in this debate very respectfully, and I think it's a real credit to, to everyone here. So um, I'm, I'm very proud to be a senator in this place with people like you that are prepared to uh, uh, have a debate like this uh, with, with the kind of respect that's been shown. Look, I, I do support this amendment. Um, I, I, in my second reading contribution, I spoke about concern that there is in other jurisdictions around the world. Uh, in Belgium, they allow for people with uh, mental health issues to be able to seek out uh, euthanasia in, uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, they've legislated there to allow children, uh, people under the age of 18. And, uh, and my concern is that we've been asked here with this bill to make a decision about uh, what will eventually be legislation that will be introduced into uh, the Northern Territory and in the ACT around uh, assisted suicide. And I couldn't. Um, I feel that we're, we're making a decision here uh, when we don't actually know properly what the, uh, what the ramifications will be and what safeguards will be in place. So these amendments uh, go some of the way. Of course, it's, you know, it's already passed the second reading. Uh, this is about just putting up some, some rails uh, just to prevent, uh, to, so that we can be sure that uh, as a Senate, uh, as a parliament here, that, that the uh, safeguards are in place to make sure that uh, we can't allow uh, laws that would enable children, or indeed uh, those that um, uh, that are those that have mental health condition, uh, would they be able to seek out this this support, so or this this these services? So, for that on that basis, uh, I'll be uh, I'll be voting for these amendments. Senator Little. Um, but I'd like to put this on record. The Australian Capital Territory and the Northern Territory are so far apart and not just in terms of distance. It is simplistic to think the Restoring Territory Rights Bill is about territory rights. This bill only seeks to repeal sections of the Act that deal with a single issue, medically assisted dying. The NT population is small at 233,000. 44 per cent of its citizens are Aboriginal. 30 per cent of its population is regarded as just visiting. Average individual income is $267 less than the ACT. Compare those figures to the ACT population at just over 454,000, 2 per cent of whom are Aboriginal, 20 per cent have more tertiary education than the NT. The Northern Territory Federal seat of Lingari, which covers the NT, except Greater Darwin, has the highest proportion of Indigenous people of any electorate in the country, many of whom live in remote communities, and the lowest rate of voter enrolment in the nation. If the NT considers this, it is those people who will be poorly represented in the conversation. Illness and death visits Aboriginal people at uber-alarming rates compared to other Australians. I have weighed up the fact the need to protect the most vulnerable people is necessary, those who will be impacted differently and disproportionately by this legislation. Regardless of cultural, social, economic disadvantage, these people need greater protection, so I support this amendment. Legislation is one thing, but its implementation is quite another. I have considered also spending millions and millions on improving the high rate of early death of Aboriginal people—12 years less for men and 10 for women—only to offer those with multiple complex chronic illness a legal way to bring about an early death. And remember, there is more death, much earlier and with much more comorbidity, caused by health issues heart and kidney disease, diabetes, liver disease, chronic lower respiratory disease, cancer. These are major contributors in Aboriginal communities. 
This legislation would be significant for the people of the Northern Territory, and they need to have this explained to them to avoid fear and misinformation. I am a senator for South Australia, but I was born, raised and still have land, family and community connections in the Northern Territory, in the towns, in remote communities and even in town camps. It is my lived understanding, not a textbook understanding, of these unintended consequences. These are very real issues. I refer to an assessment of the view of some Aboriginal communities in a study from 1996. Yes, it was some 26 years ago, but nothing of note has been done since. The results, though, couldn't have been clearer. 900 people in 100 communities took part. The result? It was virtually unanimous. A statistically undeniable 99.7 per cent against voluntary assisted death. That's almost every Indigenous person interviewed for this research being against it. And coercion, which is a very real issue in communities, is a very real issue for those ex who experience it and must be part of the conversation. This has been highlighted as a key issue in the lively debates about voluntary assisted death. I'm not talking about those who just harass, intimidate and silence, but also those who simply have busy lives and have difficulty with patience, attention and advocacy demanded of someone who is very ill and demanded of them when somebody is very ill. We need to protect those vulnerable to the threat of coercion. I'm not alarmist to acknowledge that should the NT move to legalising, it will make vulnerable people even more vulnerable. Additional safeguards are needed, and they are needed in the Northern Territory, and that's why I support this amendment. Next, uh, Senator Pocock, and then I'm coming we're going clockwise. Thank you, Chair. Uh, firstly, I would like to echo the comments about the, respect, the respectful way that this debate has taken place in the Senate. This is a bill that means a lot to the community that I represent, and I would like to take uh, a moment to thank a number of people who are here in the galleries uh, this evening, uh, Samuel Whitsed for his dedication and courage on this to, to see it through and, and lending his voice to get this done, Kate and Curley, who have been in and out of the Senate for a while. Um, thank you for your courage, as, as acknowledged by Senator Gallagher, uh, Gina Pincus. Thank you for your um, advocacy, uh, Marshal Perron, uh, our Chief Minister Andrew Barr, the AC Leader of the Opposition, Elizabeth Lee, AC Minister for Human Rights, Tara Chain, Andrew Denton and Dr Linda Swan from Go Gentle, uh, the staff at the Canberra Times who have never let this matter get out of the uh, spotlight here in the ACT and, and, and nationally, uh, Greens senators who have passionately fought for the rights of the territory to be, to be restored for over uh, a decade now, and of course uh, to my territory colleagues in the lower house, uh, Alicia Payne MP and Luke Gosling MP for for uh, introducing this this bill together, and my broader territory colleagues Andrew Lee. Uh, Marion Scrimjaw and Senator Melody McCarthy for your support and to Senator Gallagher for her advocacy on this issue for, for a decade or so, both at the um, Legislative Assembly and, and in this place. And tonight we finally get to bring this to a vote. Uh, I hope we can continue this debate respectfully until that happens, uh, but I wanted to take uh, a bit of time to speak to the amendments. As Senator Gallagher and uh, Senator Scar made note. Uh, these amendments do come from a, a, a good place. Uh, however, I'd like to point out that the, the whole point of this bill is to remove the restraints on the territories, to restore our democratic right to debate and legislate on this issue in our local parliaments. Uh, these amendments add more restraints and go against the core aim of this bill, to allow the territories the same legislative rights and freedoms as the states, the same legislative freedoms as the vast majority of uh, 
senators in here and the, the people that they, they, they represent in their, in their states. The self-government acts were always intended to allow this legislative equality. Uh, with this simple repeal bill, uh, we go back to that, and I do not believe that these amendments are necessary. Overnight, I sought an opinion from Barrister Fiona McLeod, AOSC, on the substantive amendment from Senator Nampajimpa Price. Her observations were that the definition offered in the Disability Discrimination Act would essentially render this bill ineffective. Under the Act, And under, under the Act, and rightly so, anyone with a terminal illness could be thought of as, li as living with a disability. Therefore, if this amendment were to pass, the ACT and Northern Territory would be unable to legislate a voluntary assisted dying scheme for the terminally ill. On another matter, the, the definition of mental impairment under the Criminal Code would create more uncertainty. Mental impairment in this context requires consideration of effect and context in a crim criminal court case, uh, no less. As McLeod said in her opinion, this, this definition's incorporation into the bill is unwieldy. I won't be supporting this amendment. The bill is simple. It is about restoring the democratic rights of the territories. It allows the ACT and the Northern Territory to have the same respectful, considered discussions on voluntary assisted dying as our friends, families, and neighbours in other states. This, this, this bill is about saying that the ACT and the Northern Territory should have the same right as the states in Australia to consult, to debate, to legislate on this very uh, important issue to, to, to some in, in our communities but clearly an issue that is, is tightly held and deeply personal. And I think we see that reflected in the way that the states have done that, the extensive consultation they've gone through. As, as Senator Hume uh, talked about in her very moving speech, the states have significant safeguards in their legislation about who, who can access this in what situations. And I have no doubt that the territories would undertake a similar process. The benefit of the territories going last is that they have all the learnings from the states. And while I accept that around the world that there may, there may be um, examples which uh, are um, potentially shock shocking, uh, we are in Australia and, and my sense is that the territories will follow in the footsteps of the states on this issue. And so I would urge senators to keep that in mind when we vote tonight. This is about people in the ACT and the Northern Territory having the same democratic right to make these important decisions in our own parliaments. Thank you, Senator Pocock. I'm going to go to Senator Steele-John, then Senator Roberts, and then I'll continue working my way around the chamber. Senator Steele-John, you have the call. Thank you, Chair. In contributing to this debate, I want to begin by acknowledging uh, that there is a, an amendment before the Chamber currently uh, which purports to be uh, an amendment for the benefit and protection of disabled people um, in relation to a bill um, that is uh, principally and solely, as Senator Pocock outlined for us about uh, the repealing of a piece of legislation that prevents uh, the Territory uh, from engaging in a democratic discussion about the laws which govern it in relation to voluntary assisted dying. Now, in responding to the amendment and putting my position uh, to the Senate, I want to tackle, uh, first of all, the reality that many disabled people watching the debate tonight. There will be many disabled people across the country who legitimately uh, observe this debate and feel either a sense of concern about voluntary assisted dying um, or um, a support for the, piece of for the amendment offered to that relevant piece of legislation. And I do understand 
the concerns held by some disabled people in relation to voluntary assisted dying. I had the opportunity a couple of years ago to go with a, a couple of friends of mine who are uh, amazing disability activists in Western Australia to a protest they were holding against a film uh, which had recently then been released, a film by the name of You Before Me, um, that featured characters, uh, one of whom was disabled, and it chronicled the story of an individual who, upon becoming disabled, uh, made the decision uh, to fly off to a a Swiss suicide clinic and take their own life because basically they couldn't uh, think of anything worse than living as a disabled person. And as a protest to that film, um, my colleagues uh, were able to obtain permission to rock up in front of the cinema with tables uh, and signs that read, uh, help me go to a Swiss suicide clinic. I'm disabled. I don't want to live anymore. And during the course of two and a half hours, they were able to raise over $250 from people going in and out of the movies who not only were willing to give them money to go off to a, a so-called suicide clinic, but encouraged them to do so and thanked them for their bravery and courage in acknowledging that they were burdens or were becoming burdens to their family members. It's a story that has always stuck with me and I think reveals the deep ableism that does exist in our community, that is perpetrated by decision makers and perpetuated by decision makers in this place. We must acknowledge the reality that as we navigate these pieces of legislation, we are doing so in a broader cultural context that often normalises the idea that it is better to be dead than to be disabled. It is important that we acknowledge that. And it is also important to acknowledge uh, that, uh, as uh, have been quoted by other senators during the course of the debate, uh, that the uh, UN Special Rapporteur on Disabilities has made comments to the Government of Canada in relation to concerns over their administration of their system and uh, amendments that may be needed to that process. Those things are right and proper to do. What it is not okay to do, what it is not okay to do, is to weaponize disabled people's lives and our safety and protection uh, for political purposes. That is not okay. Now, there are senators in this place who have cited comments given to the Australian government in relation to our compliance with the, Uni with the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Disabled People. They are right to do that. I would remind them also that during the course of the previous government and the course of the government before that, Australia has been repeatedly told by the Special Rapporteur that we are in violation of many, many articles of that convention including, I will bring to the Senate's chain, uh, attention, the reality that right now in Australia it is legal to forcibly sterilise a disabled person under the law. And the Commonwealth Government, under both Labour and Liberal leadership, has refused repeatedly to take action to end that practice. So if we're going to quote human rights recommendations, then there is a hell of a lot of work to do in the Australian space when it comes to disability. Now, I sit here as a disabled person that has many friends that are concerned about voluntary assisted dying. I sit here as a disabled person who will be supporting this piece of legislation, who will be voting soundly in opposition to this amendment. Why? First and foremost, because this is a bill which seeks solely to repeal a preventative legislative measure that is currently preventing the Territory from engaging in a conversation around voluntary assisted dying. Once this bill is passed through this chamber, then it will be up to the ACT legislature, as it has been up to the legislatures of every other state and territory, uh, state, not territory, to engage in a consultation process around the safeguard net mechanisms which are required. And it is incumbent upon the ACT Assembly that they do this and do this vigorously. 
and to engage in the NT, and to do that and to do it vigorously, and to ensure that there are proper safeguards and where there are learnings internationally, have them incorporated and engage the people of the ACT, including disabled people, and of the NT, including disabled people, in that conversation and listen to those concerns. That is the appropriate way to deal with the concerns raised in the amendment. The, the proposer talks about the need for consultation. Where was the consultation with disabled people in relation to this amendment? It is, it is uh, totally inappropriate, after the length of this debate, to come in here this evening and propose an amendment uh, to basically block this bill, because it would make it ino inoperable. That is the actual effect of this bill. Uh, to come in here and masquerade uh, the attempt to block this bill as an attempt to protect disabled people and disabled people's lives. It is not okay and it will not go by tonight with, for, without being called out uh, for the cynical political move that it is. Just wait a moment. Senator O'Neill. Thank you. While I respect utterly the view of uh, my learned colleague here, who speaks with incredible experience and understanding of disability, I think the standing order that calls on us not to uh, basically uh, diminish others in the chamber by, by, by giving them, um, by, by articulating in your own words what their motivations are, I think takes us away from the nature of the debate that we've been having so far. And I would ask on behalf of the mover of the amendment that that, 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 um, that aspersion be actually withdrawn. I don't think it takes anything away from your excellent contribution, but I, I, just, I just think we care about this and I would suggest, Chair, that it might be appropriate for withdrawal. Thank you, Senator O'Neill. Uh, Senator Steele, John, I just draw your attention to the relevant standing orders. I'm happy to withdraw. Senator Steele, John, if you wish to continue. No, concluded. Okay, thank you. Uh, Senator Tyrrell. Thank you. Um, look, I'm grateful for the opportunity to discuss this amendment, even though I won't be supporting it. Welcome you. Look, I find it really strange that we're standing here debating this, um, whether or not the Territory should have the option to decide something for themselves. The people in the Territory should have the same rights to choose as the states do. It's as simple as that. It shouldn't matter what the topic or issue is. I find it sad that I'm being asked to stand here and vote about this, that I, as a Tasmanian, have the responsibility to decide whether or not territories get to decide issues for themselves. If you hadn't guessed, I'm 100 per cent in favour of this bill, and I think we should pass it without delay. People are focusing on the end result of this bill, that the ACT and Northern Territory will legislate voluntary assisted dying. They're opposing the bill based on that. But that's not all this bill is about. It's about the Territory's rights to make these decisions for themselves. It's not a surprise that this has become a debate about morals and voluntary assisted dying. I've always said that if I stay true to my moral compass in this place, I'll be okay. And my moral compass says that there's nothing wrong with making sure people can make their own choices the one that's best for themselves and their families. They're the only ones that should be able to do this. I stand here tonight and I'm so proud of Tassie and what we have in place. Voluntary assisted dying has been legal for one month in our state now. I know it's early days and there's still a few challenges to overcome. However, Tassie has the right to overcome this as Tasmanians see fit without interference. I'd like to give a shout out to Mike Gaffney, MLC, for the amazing work he did on our bill. He spent years working on this legislation and it was a very long campaign. So many brave people stood up and told their stories. Stories about family members who went through so much and in a perfect world they wouldn't need to. Jackie and Natalie Gray, they led the campaign in memory of their beautiful mama. Their tireless efforts did not go unnoticed by the Tassie community. Jackie and Natalie, from one Tasmanian to another, thank you. My fellow senators in this chamber have told similar stories. 
Senator Hume stood up and told her story only a few months ago. And it was powerful to hear from someone who once voted against this issue, who has now gone through that experience and now will vote for this bill. It was an incredibly meaningful contribution to this debate. And I thank Senator Hume for her courage and for sharing her story with us. I can't imagine ever being in a position where I or someone that I love is told that our time on this earth is coming to an end. If I was, I'd want the option to decide how I go. Spending months or years in pain with no quality of life is not something anybody should be forced to go through. I understand there are people in this chamber who aren't supportive of this bill or voluntary assisted dying. I respect your right to have that opinion. It's not for me to stand here and tell you what to think or feel, but my thoughts are this. What does it matter to the rest of us if someone chooses to end their own suffering? The sky isn't going to fall in because John from across the road had the option and chose peace. Voluntary assisted dying should be an individual choice. It doesn't matter what I think, what the Senate thinks, what this parliament thinks. All that matters is that people are allowed to make the choice that best suits them, their family and their circumstances. This week there's been lobbyists running around the hallways of parliament. No surprise there. They've been lurking in people's doorways, demanding them to make changes to the bill, doing the rounds once, twice, maybe even three times for some officers. I don't think these people are even from the territories. I don't think what they've been doing is OK. Who are they to say that people in the ACT and the Northern Territory can't make this decision for themselves? Who are they to try and take away the choice for the ACT and the Northern Territory to decide for themselves when they themselves have that right? So for everyone in the ACT and the Northern Territory, I'm sorry that you're being treated as second-class citizens, as if you shouldn't have the same rights as the states to decide for yourselves what is best for you. You have my full support. It has never been a question for me that this is the right thing to do. Thank you, Senator Tyrrell. Uh, I'm going to be going to Senator Roberts, then Senator Birmingham, Birmingham, then Senator Shoebridge, and then I'll continue moving around the chamber. Senator Roberts, you have the call. Thank you, Chair. And, and let me start by, first of all, through you, Chair, ad addressing comment to the Minister, uh, Minister Gallagher, because um, you have conducted yourself in an exemplary way throughout this whole debate. Uh, I note particularly the way you um, accepted and inquired into Senator Dunningham's um, deep conviction but uncertainty in, in, in knowing what to do. You allowed, allowed that to be talked through. Uh, there were people here who are used to the, the behaviour in this chamber of not trusting each other, and some of them I reassured that uh, there's nothing su suspicious going on. This bill is passed. The second reading was won, so uh, you, you won that. But I thank you so much for the, not only for doing what you did in allowing Senator Dunningham to, to speak, but the way in which you did that, Minister. I also want to, through you, Chair, acknowledge Senator Dunningham because something in his gut told him and, and he really came up and delivered. So I thank you so much for that. What's different about this debate, I've noticed, compared with most debates in this chamber, is the people actually listening to each other, connecting and caring. I'm, no, I'm in a bit of a conflicted position because I'm strongly in support of states' rights, but territories are not states. Um, I uphold the Constitution. So I'm not going to go there. I've already acknowledged that uh, this debate, uh, this, this bill has been passed through the second reading and it will go through in the third reading. But I sincerely believe that this debate is not about territory rights. It's about euthanasia. And as I said, we lost. I accept that. People here who will be with Senator Dunningham, Senator Nampa Jimper Price, Senator O'Sullivan, and myself and others are making sure, Senator Little, are making sure that their deep needs 
for caring for others are met and safeguards are in place. Senator Nampajimpa Price has, throughout the, her, her career and in her brief time in the Senate, demonstrated exemplary integrity. She is a woman, a person of complete integrity. She and I and others are concerned about children. It deeply saddens me that we have to discuss that. Senator Steele John has spoken well about people with disability, and Senator Nampa Jimpa Price has also talked about people with mental health issues. Vulnerable people, vulnerable people, what's next? Aged, sick, lonely. So that's my concern. That's why I will be supporting Senator Nampa Jimpa Price and Senator Dunham with this, with this amendment. I will, though, tack on something. This has worked well, this debate, even though my position hasn't succeeded, it's worked well because I haven't heard any talk about parties. That's not meant as a joke. That's meant since, I, I know that, Senator McKenzie. Uh, I, I'm not a woman, but I had the intuition to work out where you were laughing. <laughs> um, but I wonder, I wonder what would happen in this place if the Senate sat in state blocks and territory blocks? Just a thought. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Senator Birmingham. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, Chair, I want to acknowledge firstly the, the widespread community interest in, uh, in this debate. Uh, as there often is in free votes and conscience matters that come before this parliament, which as others have reflected upon, these types of conscience votes do often bring out the best of thoughtful, considered, calm and reflective debate around the chamber. And I acknowledge with that the very strong and personally held views around the chamber, dividing almost every party in this chamber, on issues that people care about, be it the questions associated with voluntary assisted dying and or the questions associated with territory rights. And people have brought those perspectives to bear here in good faith right around the chamber. And I think it is important to acknowledge that. Uh, Senator Gallagher acknowledged a number of people who were uh, here observing the debate, many in the gallery, many others paying attention. Uh, she did also then come up to me afterwards, uh, um, having realised that she had uh, missed noticing um, the State, the ACT a Liberal leader, Elizabeth Lee, in the, uh, in the gallery before. And so in acknowledging everybody else and, uh, and doing so on behalf of all of us, Elizabeth, thank you for being here along with the many others. I want to welcome very much the second reading vote that took place that provided uh, a clear indication of support for territory rights, 41 to 25 in this chamber, uh, following the 99 to 37 uh, majority in the House of Representatives strong, clear endorsements of both chambers uh, for the adoption of territory rights. As I said in my second reading remarks, much has changed since 1997. Much has changed since 1997 when the restrictions on the territories were put in place. Though I did not support those restrictions all the way back then, I can understand the sentiment that led to them at that stage, the sense that the Northern Territory was undertaking what was in a global sense an element of legislative adventure at the time. We have come a long way since then with, in this country, all six Australian states having now legislated for models of voluntary assisted dying. It is no more legislative adventure to pursue such a model. It is indeed common practice across Australia and indeed in many more other parts of the world. Importantly, each of those six state models around the country presents a model for the territories to consider in their legislative journey should the restrictions in place be lifted. They present a model that didn't exist in 1997, as sound or solid as, uh, as the model that Marshall Perrin and Territorians legislated at that time may have been. There are now many others to look at and, critically, each of them coming with very extensive safeguards in place. Senator Nampajimpa Price rightly brings to this chamber an amendment that seeks to address some of the important issues of safeguards. Senator Nampajimpa Price uh, is a proud Territorian. She brings this forward 
I have no doubt, absolutely in good faith. She expressed her views in relation to territory rights clearly, strongly, forcefully, as she does on every matter uh, that, uh, that she speaks about. And as Senator Gallagher, Senator Scar and others have acknowledged, it is that good faith that we should consider the questions she has brought forward. And Senator Nampajimpa Price and Senator Little, in particular, uh, rightly highlighted the crucial role of effective safeguards, especially in relation to the Northern Territory. Uh, we should not be closed to the unique circumstances of the NT and its vulnerable communities. They're right to hi highlight the paramount importance of having effective safeguards in place. And I trust that through this amendment being tabled and rightly debated and facilitated through this process, their message is loudly and clearly heard in terms of the importance of getting those safeguards right. However, there are many safeguards to be considered in legislating for voluntary assisted dying. Those contained in the amendments of Senator Nampajimpa Price are about some of those that either Territory must consider in terms of legislating a model. And that is why I think it is important that if we are restoring the rights to legislate for voluntary assisted dying to the Territories, it should not be in a manner where the Commonwealth seeks to part legislate the model of voluntary assisted dying they adopt. We should restore those rights, doing so confident that democratically elected assemblies in those territories will consider all of the safeguards necessary for effective models of voluntary assisted dying. So I won't be supporting the amendment put forward in good faith uh, by my colleague. I do certainly, and I'm sure I speak for all senators in expecting that the territories consider these matters thoroughly and embed these types of safeguards in ways that effectively work for a model of voluntary assisted dying. That is what we should expect of them. That is what has occurred across the six Australian states in the different models that they have deployed and put in place. Uh, and that is what putting the rights for the territories back in the hands of the territories will enable each of them to do as well. Senator Shoebridge. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Um, I rise on behalf of my party, the Greens, to indicate we will not be supporting this amendment. This amendment, if it was passed, would see the parliament uh, restoring the rights for Territorians with one hand and then taking them away with the other. That would be the effect of this, of, of this amendment. Um, and I do want to acknowledge the lived experience and the truth of the contribution of my colleague, Senator Steelejohn, and I want to associate myself unambiguously with, his with the contribution that Senator Steelejohn made to the chamber. Um, and I want to also acknowledge all of the advocates, uh, um, all of those who have worked for more than two decades to hopefully get us to this point. And, and we should be clear that if this chamber accepts this amendment, it will be completely undermining the bill. This process and the decades of work will have failed. That would be the effect of accepting the amendments to this bill. And, and I note the work of uh, Senator David Pocock and his office in obtaining the advice from Fiona MacLeod, SC. And, and it's worthwhile just reading onto the, um, onto the record, I think, perhaps the key paragraph um, from, um, uh, from, from that advice. And it's in relation to the definition of disability. It says this, finally, the incorporation of the definition of disability into the bill will render the bill ineffective. A person seeking access to assisted dying will inevitably fall within at least one of the limbs of the definition of disability. By way of illustration, if the amendments are adopted, a person diagnosed with an advanced incurable disease expected to cause death within months and causing intolerable suffering, the eligibility criteria under Victoria's Voluntary Assisted Dying Act 2017 and New South Wales Voluntary Assisted Dying Act 2022, could not be the subject of a territory voluntary assisted dying law. There you have it in black and white from a senior counsel. That you can't on one hand say you support territory rights and on the other hand accept this amendment because the amendment fundamentally, comprehensively undermines the bill. And I'll, I'll finish with this. This is not the right place to put these checks and balances in. And an amendment that was tabled only hours, uh, 
hours ago without the consultation. It's not. And I know that because in my time in the New South Wales State Parliament, I engaged in two, two separate um, um, attempts to put in place voluntary assisted dying. Once in 2013, which unfortunately didn't succeed, but it took months and months of debate and consultation, detailed committee consideration, with, with, with I think well over 100 submissions in that initial, um, that initial phase in 2013. It didn't succeed. And then again, in the legislation that finally passed earlier this year. And again, these considerations, detailed, detailed work with disability groups, with the medical profession, with the legal profession, and that consultation will happen in the territories if we allow them to do it. And that's where that consultation should happen. That's where amendments like this need to be considered. And we should not kid ourselves that if the Senate accepts this amendment, they will have destroyed the utility of the bill and will be back at first base. Uh, Senator Hanson Young and then Senator O'Neill. Uh, thank you, um, Chair. This bill is precisely about putting the rights back into the hands of Territorians. And sadly, this amendment would do the exact opposite. It, it, it would effectively render the bill useless. We stand here, sit here tonight, debating this piece of legislation, which for 25 years Territorians have been asking for. For 25 years the Senate has made Territorians suffer, because in 1997, this place did the wrong thing. It did the wrong thing by taking those rights away from Territorians. And back then, 25 years ago, Australians knew it was wrong. Opinion poll after opinion poll showed that Australians generally, in whatever state or territory you live, did not support the bill going through. And then in the days and weeks after that original bill was put in, it was called the Senate's Night of Shame. Today, tonight, we have an opportunity to right that wrong. And I just wanted to give a short contribution. I know there's been so many eloquent speeches put on the record on this issue for, an so, for so, so long. But I wanted to pay uh, contribution specifically to the former leader of the Greens and former Senator Bob Brown, because he was here in this place 25 years ago arguing against the attack on Territorians as this bill went through, and not just the democracy that was under threat but the rights of people to choose dignity, the rights of people to choose to end suffering, to end pain. And in his second reading speech back in 1997, Bob called on his fellow colleagues to think about the unnecessary pain and suffering that this place was inflicting on them. And I can't be in this chamber tonight without thinking of how many people in 25 years have suffered because this place did the wrong thing on that night. This is about choice. This is about rights. But ultimately, this is about human dignity. It was called the Senate's Night of Shame for a reason. People were outraged. They were insulted. They were offended. They were hurt. They felt as though their parliamentarians had let them down. And we may all have our own opinions, and we do, deeply held, of what we would do if we were faced with that choice. But Australians, by and large, have always accepted 
that it is a personal choice and that just because we are a member of the parliament does not give us a right, a God-given right, to inflict unnecessary pain and suffering on somebody else. And so tonight I'd just like to, I know there's a number of important people in the gallery here and I acknowledge uh, Andrew Denton and Andrew Barr, um, but I specifically wanted to acknowledge uh, the long-held fight of uh, former Senator Bob Brown to this. Mm -hmm. Year after year after year, since 1997, he stood in this very place asking for us to right the wrong that was done 25 years ago, and it's time that we did. Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy President. Um, this is the sound of democracy. The stridency, the pauses, the hope, the emotion, the respect, the difference. And uh, sometimes it concerns me that the debate about democracy calls for beautiful harmony. And I like, you know, thirds. I love singing. I love the harmony that results when voices come out. But the sound of democracy is not always harmonious. And when it's at its best, it's not autocratic. It's not one view over the others with judgment everywhere. It's a multiplicity of voices. And I actually said in one of, um, one of our committee meetings this morning, the first time I heard the music of Shostakovich, I thought, oh, this is, this is not the sort of music I'm able to cope with. I'm not able to listen to it. I'm not able to stand it because there's too much tension in the music. It didn't sound familiar enough to me. I wanted sweet harmonies from the Romantic period, but I learned to love it, as I've learned to love democracy. And so I'm very proud to be sitting in this chamber um, alongside colleagues who are giving serious thought to this issue that's under debate as a matter of conscience and free vote for all of us. I, I want to um, just respond to the contribution of Senator um, no, from, no from Tasmania. Senator Sen Senator Tammy T Tyrrell, thank you very much. So Senator Tyrrell, who um, who asked, I think, really a very good question, which is like one of these fundamental democratic questions. Why am I here as a senator of Tasmania making a decision about people who live in the ACT and, and the Northern Territory? Well, you're here because you're a federal senator. We are a federation. And in what we do and what we're referring to here, we are actually speaking uh, into the space that's been constructed by our constitution. And it is a fact that the purpose of this bill, entitled the Restoring Territory Rights Bill, is to amend the Australian Capital Territory Self-Government um, Act 1988 and the Northern Territory Self-Government Act 1978 to remove the current provisions, uh, provisions currently uh, preventing the territories from passing legislation, which would allow for voluntary assisted dying. That, that's, that's what we are doing here. And we are doing it because section 122 of the Constitution provides that the Commonwealth has plenary powers to legislate for the territories. So while this bill is colloquially described as restoring territory rights. Ultimately, it's not giving rights to the territories that are held by states. It's giving a right on one issue. It doesn't resolve the relationship between the federal and the state, uh, the federal and the territories completely. This is despite much debate that articulates that this is just about territory rights. This is about one particular right, and it deserves our attention. It is the right of, of voluntary assisted dying, which in other contexts is called euthanasia. Now, I, um, I've made clear in my second reading speech my particular uh, view on this matter, and uh, I 
know that there was a vote last week when I wasn't here in the parliament, and I uh, hear the contribution from Senator Roberts about the way in which that was conducted and his clarity about how this is going to turn out. And uh, maybe mine will be a strident voice and not a harmonious one tonight, but I think it's an important night to put things on the record. I, I won't resolve from the fact that I represent here in this place the Great Australian Labor Party. And amongst the Labor Party and the Liberal Party, and dare I say the Green Party and independents, there are people of faith. And they do wonderful things in our community. Their faith gives them action to do good works. They care. Our hospitals, many of them, first established by orders of faith. So I want to put on the record that part of this debate that needs to be profoundly respected, even if you are not a person of faith, is that there is a faith position not shared harmoniously within each faith. Stridently held views, but there are powerful, strong views, and there is tradition, there is, uh, there is dogma, there is uh, thinking, there is uh, a whole literature base about euthanasia and life. And that voice, at odds with those who are fighting as wonderful citizens in this country for voluntary assisted dying, is a voice that we need to accept and live with. It's here in the chamber, it's in our community, it should be reflected everywhere. So, uh, and that will be dealt with with another piece of legislation protecting religious freedom, or prote uh, pr protecting people against religious discrimination. So, so we, are, we are this wonderful, multicultural, multi-faith community. So I do not resolve from the fact that it is a faith education in wonderful Catholic schools uh, that gives me some confidence in putting on the record my particular view about voluntary assisted dying, which is that there are inherent risks that give me great concern. Um, so I want to make it clear that my view is that this bill is about euthanasia, and that seems to be the flavour of the conversation or the debate that we're having around the chamber this evening. I also want to acknowledge the contributions of senators, not just in the second reading debate, over the many months that we have been um, having this um, consideration. But the contributions this evening of uh, my colleague Senator Scar about in good faith conversations that are here are here, and I will have a couple of questions uh, to both Senator Gallagher and to Senator Nampajimpa Price about my concerns about the language that's in the amendment, the concerns that have been raised about the definitional matter, and if I may ask Senator Pocock immediately um, in referring to what Senator Shoebridge said about advice that has been received from a barrister that you refer to in your own speech, Senator Pocock, uh, that that perhaps might be tabled. Because as this bill wraps up this evening, and it will go to a vote, these are resources that become useful to those from the Territory, whether it's the ACT or the Northern Territory, in the deliberations that will occur. And I want to acknowledge my colleagues here in, the, in this place, um, from the Northern Territory, from the ACT, from the Labor Party, and also those who are from the Northern Territory and the ACT in the opposition and on the crossbenches. Are there any? Yes, yes. The agitator, the man who's done what he promised and brought this to the attention of the parliament. That's a good thing because that's democracy in action. So I, I just wonder if I can, I can stop for a moment there and just, Senator Pocock, are you willing to table the advice from the barrister that you have received that gives you a particular view about the risks inherent in the amendment that's been moved by Senator Nampa Jimper Price? Senator Pocock. Um, thank you, Chair. I'll, I'll be guided by the Senate if I'm happy you, you to. Can, you're free to table it if, you, if that is your. You can have to seek, to. I understand you have um, to seek leave, but I, I would expect leave to be granted. I'd seek leave to table. Is leave advice. granted? Leave is granted. Senator O'Neill. Thank you. Um, I, I want to um, just to uh, respond to a couple of points that have been made in the debate. Uh, particularly with regard to concerns about 
coercion. And I do bemoan the fact, um, and I, I'm in agreement um, with Senator Shoebridge on this matter, that there are things that are being brought before us at the last, at the last leg home that deserved greater and more careful consideration. And it troubles me that there was not the opportunity for us to undertake a, a full inquiry. We, we do so much good committee work here in, in the Senate, and it, it troubles me that there wasn't a committee uh, charged with the responsibility of perhaps gathering this information and doing the good work that the Senate does before we got to this point on the particular matter that's been moved in this amendment. So I think that that's, um, that's a concern for me about where we are in terms of management. Um, and I particularly think it's, uh, it goes to some of the points that have been made about people with disability and the consultation of people with disability that I think were, were very well made uh, by Senator Steelejohn this evening. Um, I am concerned, and uh, I don't know if uh, Senator Nampajimpa Price or Senator Gallagher can answer this question, but it's, I am concerned about the commentary from Senator Shoebridge, who has said this evening that he, with, with great confidence, so it must be coming from somewhere, otherwise you would never come into this place and just make bold assertions for you know, grandstanding, not on a matter so important. So Senator Shoebridge has, has claimed tonight that if the amendment passed, the amendment of Senator Nampa Jeffer Price passes, that it will render inoperable and undermine the, any bill in the territories. Now, I'm seeking clarification on that very solid assertion that you've made, and perhaps some of the answers are in what's being received. Uh, so, so I understand that that may be in the advice that's received and that there may be an answer that's possible from either Senator Nampajimpa Price or from Senator Gallagher. Senator McCarthy. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy President. Uh, I would like to rise to speak to the amendment uh, before the Senate and thank uh, Senator Nampajimpa Price for bringing forward the amendment. I know it's been a very difficult time, a very difficult week and a difficult six months uh, as we all try and dig deep on an issue that requires us to use our conscience and reflect deeply on what matters in why we stand to speak for what we do, to support what we do and to say no to what we don't support. And I respectfully uh, say to my fellow Territory Senator that I don't support uh, her amendment. I do believe, as I said in my previous statements, not only in this debate but over so many years that we've raised it here before the Senate that it is about the rights of the people of the territories. It is about the rights of the people in the ACT and the Northern Territory. And that to look at this amendment now, in my view, would only repeal what it is we are here to do. It is very clear, Senators, what the territories are asking us to do tonight. I take this opportunity to acknowledge Chief Minister, former Chief Minister Marshall Perrin. It's good to see you. And Chief Minister Andrew Barr. I want to bring to the Senate and listening to some of the speakers, I think it's really important to point out that yes, we do have a small population in the Northern Territory, but we have big hearts. We have great thinkers. We excel at so many levels. We only have to look at the COVID pandemic, where we were so fearful for the lives of First Nations people in this country. We were so fearful for the lives of First Nations people in the Northern Territory. And since 
The former Chief Minister introduced the bill in the Northern Territory in 1995. The Northern Territory has grown exponentially in those skills and knowledge and ability to make its own decisions. We have 13 Aboriginal community controlled health sectors across the Northern Territory who ensured through all of those practitioners that they could go out to each and every Aboriginal community in the Northern Territory, along with the health practitioners of the Northern Territory Health. It was the people of the Northern Territory who put their hand up to support all Australians and the first plane load that needed help from China landed in Darwin. And it was our health professionals who carried the load for our country. It was our health professionals through the OSMAT team that reached out to Christmas Island, where the first couple of plane loads went, to treat our Australians who were fearful of having the COVID pandemic. That in itself, Senators, shows the incredible weight that we carry as a small jurisdiction and a small population and our ability to do what we believe we should do to help others. So why is it that we are constantly told we cannot make any decisions for ourselves, that we cannot have even the opportunity to debate an important decision? I want to take this opportunity to bring the voices of two former Indigenous politicians in 1995. who spoke about voluntary euthanasia. One of them was the, miss, was the late Mr Wes Lanapoy, the member for Arnhem. And he said in his speech on this debate, like other members, I have taken the issue up with many people in my electorate, not only with Aboriginal people, but also with communities such as Anurugu on Groot Island, whose residents indicated their views to me. If we are to mature and accept responsibilities such as statehood, I have had close personal experience of terminal illness, and I can express a personal view as to its effects and what is involved in that traumatic period when seeing someone undergoing a very hard time in their life and facing a tragic end. Mr Speaker, I can assure you that in the 11 years that I have been in Parliament, this is the most difficult bill that I've ever had to examine and ponder on. I've had sleepless nights over it for a whole range of reasons, not the least being my personal feelings towards it because of the personal tragedy that I mentioned earlier in my life. At the time, I express my thanks to you, Mr Speaker, the Chief Minister and many others who helped me through that period. It was a very difficult time. I've never had the opportunity to raise those questions in my life. I, for one, would like to see this bill supported because I believe that I have been given the right to express my view in this case. And that was the late Mr Wes Lanapoy, the member for Arnhem. Then you had the late Mr Morris Rioli, the member for Arafura, who spoke in that debate. And he said, since the member for Fanny Bay gave notice of his intention to introduce voluntary euthanasia legislation into the Northern Territory Legislative Assembly, people have been polarised in relation to this issue. We've also I've received nothing but indications of overwhelming opposition to this bill from constituents in my electorate of Arafura, which contains eight major Aboriginal communities and many outstations. Most of these communities have written and spoken to me about their concerns in relation to the bill. At New U on Bathurst Island, we heard from representatives. They were brought up by the missionaries. They said that they have strong Christian beliefs, as well as their own cultural and traditional beliefs, and that they do not support the bill. 
So as a Tiwi person, I am all too familiar with death and dying. I understand my stance here today will be seen to be against the rights of individuals, but I cannot walk away from my beliefs or those of my electorate, and I do not support the member for Fanny Bay's bill. Senators, I give you two examples, one for and one against. I give those examples to you because I have heard senators stand up here and speak as though we are incapable in the Northern Territory of being able to have a mature debate on all sides of politics. And that is what tonight is about. Tonight is about the Northern Territory saying to the federal parliament, please, do the right thing. Let us make our own decisions. Rightly or wrongly, they are ours. Most jurisdictions in this country have done it after the Northern Territory had led the way. Senators, I call on you to not support this amendment and please support the people of the Northern Territory. Senator McKenzie. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy President. Um, I join, I think, uh, with Senator Birmingham and Senator O'Neill. Uh, very different views to me on the substantive issue and, and the way we'll be voting, uh, and different sides of politics in your case, Senator O'Neill. But both of your contributions, for me, highlight when this chamber is at its best, um, and it is the rare moments that we get to debate and discuss uh, matters of conscience. It is when senators around the chamber who all have different views, different values, different uh, lived experiences in our nation um, stand up and respectfully put them on the record and respectfully listen to each other's very different views. I think what I've been incredibly concerned about uh, over recent years is that uh, having different values and views is suddenly becoming a dangerous idea in this fabulous liberal democracy of ours, that divergent views are somehow dangerous and debase us. But I think deriding difference is what debases us, what makes us stronger and more mature as a democracy is to actually be able to make our way through hard, difficult conversations such as this one is for the Senate. Because you know what? It's a hard and difficult situation and discussion for our com communities. To come in here and pretend that it's not is debasing difference, is not being tolerant uh, of, of divergent views, and it's not democratic. Um, these are deeply held values. They are matters of faith. With respect to the Northern Territory, um, I look forward to one day being able to debate and vote for a bill in this place that provides statehood for the Northern Territory, that provides statehood for the ACT. <laughs> um, but as my good friend and always opposing colleague Senator O'Neill put on the record, these are questions uh, that relate to faith. And for me, uh, I have been consistent in this place uh, with this particular question when it is ever before me. This year, we've been talking a lot about respect in the workplace, a lot about how we can all make this workplace a lot more respectful. I don't think we're ever going to make it kinder, kinder and gentler. I think uh, politics and the things we debate here are need to be done robustly. I mean, look at what, how we've been debating the industrial relations uh, legislation in this place and the other place this week, because we passionately oppose each other's view on this thing. That's why we were elected to do what we do on this side and why you were elected to do what you do on that side. But we do need to do things more respectfully. And, um, when I see the senators that are in my team being disrespected 
in the chamber being disrespected for their values and their views, I think it debases us all. And I thank you again, Senator O'Neill, for calling that point of order earlier. Um, I will be voting for the amendment put forward by Senator Nampajimpa Price. Um, I want to thank both her and Senator Little for their um, lived experience contributions to this place. Um, for too often, I think, we've all uh, debated ideas and issues um, without actually hearing from those who are, have the lived experience um, of how these things play out in the unique and special places that we have in this country. And so I think articulating this, her specific concerns and her careful consideration of the unique situation that is in the Territory, I think it is absolutely right and proper that this bill will pass tonight. Yep. It's heading off to the ACT and the yep. NT legislatures to do what they will. And I think it is very, very sound for a senator to stand up and say, you know what, while you're having that conversation, can you just think about these safeguards? Young people, um, those with mental impairment and the disabled. Um, they are sound, they are thoughtfully um, constructed, and whilst we have seen legal advice uh, tabled here in the Senate that says the contrary, that will make these, uh, these bills unworkable in the NT or indeed in the ACT, well, that's a real reflection on our clerks, because our clerks actually drafted these amendments so that the outcome Senator Nampajimpa Price was seeking that these very simple safeguards would be part of the uh, Sorry, I'm asking for a respectful debate, Senator Shoebridge. You, we can take it outside and you can yell at me all you like. But the way conscience votes I know you're new here, but the way conscience votes work in this place, in the Senate. Senator Polly. Order. I've been in this chamber for not enough years yet, I might add. <laughs> But when we have these debates, it is so disrespectful to interject. Whether you agree or disagree with this amendment or the substantial motion, Chair, people should be heard in silence and with respect. You can't on one day come into this chamber and talk about respect, and then when there's a debate like this, which is very emotional, I had chosen not to speak, but I do sincerely hope that people will show the same respect because we have to continue to work together tomorrow, the day after, years to come. So I ask you, Chair, to remind people of their responsibility to be respectful in this debate. I'll leave, I'll leave your fine words to the Chamber. Back to Senator McKenzie. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. Thank you. Um, Senator Polly. I think we've all known enough lawyers uh, to know that uh, you can get an opinion on, on almost any issue uh, to reflect your chosen outcome. And that is not disparaging of the legal profession. It is actually how it works. Uh, it's uh, the type of profession that uh, articulating opposing views and lawyers are very well schooled in being able to argue both sides of any given topic. They're very good at it. And so whilst I respect that uh, Senator Pocock has found a lawyer uh, that says these amendments will make the Territory Rights Bill unworkable in the ACT or the NT, I'm sure uh, we could find uh, an opposing view, shall we say, somewhere else uh, in the legal profession. But I know the clerks of the Senate very well, and I know that when they draft amendments for all of us or when they draft private senators' bills for us, um, they do that to the very, very highest standard, uh, and they will have drafted these amendments to ensure that if the Senate chose to adopt them, which it sounds like they, it won't, uh, but if the Senate chose to adopt them, that it wouldn't render the Territory Rights Bill inoperable, mm -hmm. because that would be against the intention of the senator that had sought their advice. 
Um, so on that note, I do love the days that we are our very best selves in this place. Um, and I do love the way that um, the friendships that have been developed over a long period of time um, are able to come to the fore and that you're sitting next to people that you never sit next to in our everyday work. And it only works because we do treat each other with respect at work. And I would um, seek that we have more days like this. Thank you. Uh, Senator Pocock, and then I'll go to Senator Rice. Thank you, Chair. I, I appreciate Senator McKenzie's contribution to this debate. I would like to point out to the chamber that Senator McKenzie is casting aspersions on someone who is not here to defend themselves. Uh, Barrister Fiona McLeod, AOSC, provided this advice pro bono. This was not something we sought out to get a particular outcome on. We were, land we were handed this amendment and we sought advice. So I'd just really like to clear the record there. Senator Rice, and then I go to Senator Ullman. Park. Thanks, um, Deputy President. I rise and I wish to speak against this amendment. The call of this debate that we are having and is about restoring territory rights to make decisions for themselves. And this amendment by Senator Nambajin Price would interfere with that. It would mean that a lot of those rights actually wouldn't be restored. And fundamentally, this our debate needs to be about the rights of the territories to decide for themselves. I'm a Victorian. I now live in a state where we have voluntary assisted dying. I haven't spoken in this debate before, and I will put on the record that I'm a supporter of voluntary assisted dying. And I think the way that it has been managed in Victoria has been exemplary. Um, but in one way, the fact that we are talking about voluntary assisted dying. That's not what we should be talking about here. We should be talking about the rights of the territories to be making decisions for themselves. The fact that the territories have got different rights to the states is an anachronism. It's a random facet of our colonial past that, for me as a Victorian, I have the opportunity to be part of that decision-making process, to elect my members of parliament who made that decision, but for people who live in the territories don't. And that's just not appropriate. And so the, let, this um, bill that we're debating tonight is going to go some way to restoring that, to say that on this very sensitive issue, on the issue as to whether people have got the right to choose to end their lives in a way that they desire, that is peaceful, that, um, and how they want to end, end their lives, that they have the right to do that in the ACT in the Northern Territory, just like I now do have as a Victorian. Um, I don't want to speak for it much longer. I do want to get home tonight. Um, but I really felt that it was worthwhile just putting that on the record. I also did want to acknowledge the, sort of the people in the gallery, the um, Chief Minister of the ACT, Andrew Barr, Marshall Perrin, Andrew Denton, and the people that have been following this debate for a very long time. And the fact that we've got such a full gallery shows what a significant issue it is and shows that you know, we need to be respecting the rights of Territorians to be making these decisions for themselves. Senator Ormond Payne. Thank you, Dep uh, Deputy President. I too haven't spoken on this bill, but I can't support this amendment, and I, along with my colleagues, will not be voting for it. In 2019, my mother was diagnosed with motor neurone disease, and at that time in Queensland, she did not have access to VAD. But she told me that she would have liked to have known that she at least had the choice. And I think it would have given her a lot of comfort to know that as her body degenerated and failed her, that was going to be an option for her. If this amendment passes, then people in the Territory who have a disease like motor neurone disease will not have that choice because that would clearly fall within the category of a disability. It is an insidious disease. You can't walk. You lose your ability to speak, you lose all of your ability to control your bodily functions and eventually you suffocate from that disease. It is a horrible way to die. My mother was lucky. For someone who had that disease, she cardiac arrested before she lost her ability to speak and breathe. Please let's not take away the right from people in the Territory to have their government debate and decide 
whether or not they should have the right to choose and what safeguards need to be included with it. Thank you. Senator O'Neill. just want to ask a question, but first can I convey my deep sympathy to you, Senator Alan Payne. Um, this is very, very real for, for all of us, and there is no judgment. We, we, we are best when we respect each other, and you know, that's, that's when we're our finest. So um, I'm sure everyone here and those listening would convey their deep condolences to you on your loss. Um, I'm very appreciative, Senator Pocock, of the tabling of the advice, and I have had the chance now to have a look at that. Um, it is, it is a beautifully written document, as you would expect from a barrister who has given this as a pro bono uh, contribution to our national debate on this issue. Can I just indicate that there are a few words in here that I would be picking up if I was doing some analysis in my Year 11 English class, uh, like words uh, potentially excluded, um, potentially affected. It's a very useful piece of information. I'm sure that it will be taken on board by the state, the, the, the territory. Sorry, I've, perhaps I do have an inadvertent desire for you to become a state as well. But um, this, by the territories, this will become part of what informs their deliberations moving forward. Uh, nonetheless, um, I'm not convinced of the argument that has been put on the floor this evening that by supporting Senator Nampajimpa Price's uh, motion, amendment, that that would be the end of any possibility of responding to the needs of uh, and the, the will of the people of the ACT and the Northern Territory. I also want to acknowledge the incredibly eloquent and beautiful contribution of my colleague here from the Northern Territory, um, Senator Malandiri McCarthy. Uh, I just wonder if I can ask that question again. Um, if Senator Nampajimpa Price, can you clarify for me, can you add anything um, to the debate this evening about why it is that you believe the word uh, that was put in here by the clerk solely addresses the issues about uh, protecting young people under the age of 18 and people with a disability from uh, being um, being engaged in the process of voluntary assisted dying. Senator Nambert, you a prize. Um, thank you. Um, I, I, I have stated my position. My, my colleague, um, Senator McKenzie, has also, I think, clarified this particular point. It speaks to legislation that has passed in states. Um, it's almost a copy and paste from legislation that has passed in other states. And clearly, the legislation has not um, rendered it futile for those states um, to carry out voluntary assisted dying and to legislate on voluntary assisted dying. So I just want to reiterate um, that what I propose in my amendment um, my intentions that were provided to the clerk. Our clerk um, uh, understood um, that it is not to attempt to uh, render the bill futile. As I've stated, I am in support of territory rights. Uh, I'm also um, in support of um, elevating the human rights of vulnerable people. That is probably one of the biggest priorities I have in terms of decision making in these chambers. And I have the right to do so as an elected senator for the Northern Territory. I, um, I am um, deeply concerned at the state of the Northern Territory. I have witnessed the Territory Government um, have the responsibility put back in their hands of um, alcohol uh, availability in the Northern Territory. Um, I have seen uh, the, 
vulnerable individuals' lives in their hands and uh, the way in which they have failed um, in their duty to uphold the human rights of vulnerable people in our communities. Because as we speak right now, there are children in communities who, once upon a time, not that long ago, uh, were able to live lives free of alcohol abuse. Those children are now suffering with alcohol abuse, with violence, with the threat of violence, sexual abuse constantly hanging over their heads and heightened states because the Territory government, the Files Labor government, have failed to uphold their duty to protect the vulnerable, to be able to live lives free of alcohol abuse, free of sexual abuse because of the influence of alcohol in their communities. And I will reiterate again, and particularly for some of my Greens colleagues in this chamber, I am putting these amendments forward to elevate the human rights of our vulnerable. It doesn't diminish the right for Territorians to legislate. It provides safeguards, safeguards that already exist in other states. The Territory is not losing out in any way, shape or form. The Territory will just be, it'll just be enhancing what they're able to do because all I'm seeking is to safeguard the human rights of vulnerable members of the Northern Territory and do it at this stage. Nobody is missing out from this. Nobody is losing their rights. This is about the enhancement of the human rights of the vulnerable in the Territory that I have been elected as a senator to represent. Simple as that. As simple as that. So with that, I move to put the amendments to a vote. I put the question, which is the question to put the question. Those for that question say aye. aye. Against no. I don't hear any no's, so I, uh, the ayes have it. I now put the question that the amendment standing in the name of Napachimba Price on sheet 1764 be agreed to. Those for the question say aye. aye. Against no. Aye. I think the no's have it. Is division required? A division is required. Ring the bells.
of the doors. The question before the chair is that the amendments on sheet 1764 standing in the name of Napa Chimpa Price be agreed to. Those for the amendments pass to the right of me, nose to the left of me. I put as teller for the eye, Senator O'Sullivan. Senator Urquhart, I appoint as teller for the, for the nose. Senator, there are 25 ayes and 37 noes. It's passed in the negative. Does any other senator have a contribution? If there's no contribution, I will put the final questions. I alert honourable senators that Senator Dunningham has an amendment to the report, which will be moved when I return to the President's chair, and there will be, a, there will be able to be debate on that. But that debate does not occur in the committee. Are there any questions of me at this point? I put, I put the question. The bill now stands as printed. Those with the question say aye. aye. Against, no. The ayes have it. I put that the bill as amended be agreed. No, I uh, put the bill. Uh, I, I put the question. The question is now that the bill be reported. Those with the question say aye. aye. Against, no. The ayes have it.
Honourable Senators, the committee has considered the Restoring Territory Rights Bill and agreed to it without amendment. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Ms. Uh, uh, Deputy President. I move that the report be adopted. Senator Dunningham. Thank you, uh, Deputy President. Very briefly, and I don't want to detain the Senate or those who are interested in this debate for long at all. I think it is important to note that this debate has been a long time coming, and resolution of it is important to deliver to uh, those who have been banking on it. So I will be very, very brief in my contributions. I have circulated amendments around uh, this question that the report of the committee be adopted that relate to uh, the administration of rules around access to the uh, medicines um, used in the administration of VAD and bringing them into line with other uh, medications through the processes available through the uh, Therapeutic Goods Administration and its relevant legislation. It's a very straightforward uh, amendment, um, obviously noting the scope of this legislation. Uh, it is something that is, uh, in, a, in a sense, outside of the scope of the bill that we are going to pass tonight. Uh, but I did, as I said um, last week, want to give uh, voice to the issues that have been raised, and that is what I'm doing today. It is important that we make sure we are apprised of all the facts, that all the safeguards are in place, much in the same way as the last debate uh, we've heard around uh, protection of vulnerable people in our community. Before I conclude my very brief remarks, I do also just want to add my thanks to every single senator in this chamber. I am very proud of the conduct of the debate that took place here. Uh, it was sensitive, it's difficult, and everyone has made sure that the views that were expressed were heard in good faith. I particularly want to thank uh, Senator Gallagher and Senator Hanson Young for so willingly accommodating this and enabling these amendments to be moved. I know it added another week, so I'm grateful for your time. Uh, if we can do it in this chamber, if we can have a respectful debate in this chamber, I hope that our friends in the press gallery can observe what we do and not ascribe motive without understanding why we're doing it. It is important that we are able to do this. And as I said, I'm proud of my colleagues who have very different views to my own for conducting the debate in this way. But uh, with that, I commend this amendment to the Senate. Is there any other contribution? Because I intend to put the question. I put the question that the amendment to the motion to adopt the report of the Committee of the Whole be agreed to. Those of the questions say aye. aye. Against, no. Aye. I think the noes have it. Is a division required? A division is required. Is a one-minute bill acceptable or four minutes? Four. Four has been requested. The bills will ring for four minutes.
Doors. So the question is that the amendment to the report, as moved by Senator Dunning, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator O'Sullivan as teller for the ayes and Senator Pratt as teller for the noes.
order, there being 23 ayes and 42 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. The question now is that the bill be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. I call the minister. Thank you. I move that the bill be read a third time. So the question is that the bill be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Aye. I believe the ayes have it. The ayes have it. I call the clerk. Amend the law in relation to legislative powers and territory and for related purposes. I call the clerk. Government business order of the day number one, Fair Work Legislation Amendment Secure Jobs Better Pay Bill 2022, in committee. Senators, can I ask uh, if you're not contributing to the debate that we're about to move to, if you could please leave the chamber or at least speak quietly, please? So I'll just read this. Okay, Senators, the committee is considering the Fair Work Legislation Amendment Secure Jobs Better Pay Bill 2022. The question is that the bill stand as amended be agreed to, and I'm looking for someone. Uh, Senator Cash, as I feel because I just don't feel just like I'm in, line I'm in the line of sight. I've seen you now, Senator Cash. I'm in the line of sight. I rise to move opposition amendments 1 to 16 and 21 to 28 on sheet 1779 by leave together. It's leave granted. Leave, is leave granted? I need a. Uh, there's been leave is granted. Thank you very much. And in relation to these amendments, they really do go to what is the fundamental issue before the chamber, and that is that this is a bad bill. It is a bad bill that has not been properly scrutinised by this Senate chamber. It is a bill that, unfortunately, the job creators of the country stand united and say it will not have its desired effect. It will only result in increased strike action and less jobs. In the first instance, this amendment will overturn the provisions in the bill that abolish the Australian Building and Construction Commission and the Registered Organisations Commission. Today in the Senate, as I questioned the minister, in relation to the effect of the abolition of the Australian Building and Construction Commission and whether or not the Fair Work Ombudsman would have the capacity to undertake the same, the same duties as the Australian Building and Construction Commissioner, the answer was clearly no. So why do we move this amendment? Because the building and construction industry in Australia it is fundamental to the functioning of our economy. It are contributes approximately 9 per cent of GDP. It accounts for approximately 1.15 or more than actually 1.15 million employees in Australia. And there are over 400,000 small businesses around Australia that rely on the building and construction sector. But why am I ultimately most worried? Why am I ultimately most worried 
about the abolition of the Australian Building and Construction Commission. And that's because, shortly, the workers across Australia and the Building and Construction Commission will be handed over on a silver platter to John Setka and the most militant union in Australia. So whilst, yes, those on the other side, they do have an ideological objection to the Australian Building and Construction Commission, I have to say he's already out there in South Australia and Adelaide flexing his muscle. Builders in Adelaide are very, very worried. I think the fact that the majority of the inspectors in the Fair Work Ombudsman are actually female and there doesn't appear to have been anything done to prepare them for the world of John Setka is a very, very disturbing fact. I think the fact that you have the EY report that clearly states that the economic impact of the abolition of the Australian Building and Construction Commission uh, between now and 2030 will be around $47.5 billion. The way the economy is going at the moment, higher interest rates, higher inflation, higher unemployment, uh, electricity prices that are soaring, put into that the effect of this bill on the building and construction sector and ultimately the Australian economy, and I have to say you have a train wreck ready and waiting to happen. In relation to the provisions to abolish the section or in relation to multi-employer bargaining, when you have the employers in Australia, Stand Up United, the BCA, the National Farmers Federation, the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, COSBOA, the MCA, the manufacturers, as we heard today from Senator Henderson, they represent the job creators in this country. And what they are saying to the Australian Labor Party is, we actually are telling you, as the people who represent the job creators in this country, this bill will not have the desired effect. They make it very clear that we all want to see higher wages in Australia. That is not up for debate. But they want a framework in which they can operate and actually deliver the higher wages. A design move to deliberately move away from the primacy of enterprise bargaining, bargaining at an enterprise level, which even for the Prime Ministers Rudd and Gillard, they realised that that is the essence of the employment relationship bargaining at an enterprise level. Why? Because between the employer and the employee, based on the nature of the enterprise itself, you can negotiate terms and conditions that are a win-win for both parties. And yet when this bill passes, if you have 20 or more employees in Australia in your business, you could actually be against your will roped into, compelled, use whatever words you want, into multi-employer bargaining. And based on all the questions that I put to, and I see uh, Senator Watt is out there telling people we've been wasting time actually examining this bill in the Senate chamber. It's ironic. Maybe Senator Watt doesn't know what he's actually elected here to do. <laughs> the Senate chamber, the last time I checked, please tell me, I flip open uh, any book about the Australian Senate, and I'm pretty sure it does say the House of Review, but apparently, according to Senate Watt, we don't have a role in reviewing legislation. Uh, we actually take our role very seriously. The questions that I put to minister after minister after minister were actually from employers and employees around Australia, asking merely for some guidance, merely for some guidance in relation to, well, hey, the common interest test. If we put this, this and this, together, would that mean we have a common interest? That's a matter for the Fair Work Commission. No guidance can be given to the employers in Australia as to whether or not they will or won't be roped into employer bargaining. We've also heard that there is a possibility that a business with 21 employees could actually be negotiating with a business with 200 employees. So I'm not quite sure there how that works because I'm pretty sure the business with the 200 employees they probably do have an employee that's called the Human Resources Department. And the business with the 21 employees, I'm pretty sure the Human Resources Department is, oh, that'd be the owner of the business. That'd be the owner of the business. And you see, the government's regulatory impact statement itself says that the owner of the business or the person that they actually nominate will spend 4.6 hours per day. 
Um, when I put to the department, where do you think they're going to find this 4.6 hours per day? Is it during their working hours so they actually lose profit? Or, or is it after they finish work for the day, do the books, make sure the employees are okay, go home, make sure the kids are okay, look at their watch and go, holy shivers, it's midnight and I've got to be up at 5 a.m. Oh my God, 4.6 more hours so I can actually negotiate and bargain with a business there's no resemblance to mine, but apparently it has a common interest. I don't know. You're in the same shopping centre. You're in the same suburb. I don't know. Certainly the ministers couldn't tell me, because, again, that's up to the Fair Work Commission. Uh, moving away from the primacy of enterprise bargaining, so a centralised wage-fixing scheme, as Senator Hanson, quite frankly, uh, stated today, uh, is only going to end in tears. Now, in relation to the common interest test, the amendments in relation to the common interest test will ensure that requirement for the common interest is only met if it is in the public interest. Now, why do I say that? People say, well, hey, hold on. It already says in the public interest in the Act. Ah, but you see, the drafters, very, very tricky little drafters here, they have actually lowered the bar so the test is that it's not contrary to the public interest. I have some other amendments in relation to the common interest that we will be moving uh, to provide more guidance. Um, but this is a fundamental difference. They're lowering the bar so that it's not, not in, the pub, in the public interest, it's not contrary to the public interest. Um, and again, we are inserting, and inserting a review provision uh, into the operation of the amendments made by this bill based on everything the employers have said, based on everything that the government has said that this will get wages moving. They can't tell you when. There's no modelling done. They don't know who wages are going to get moving and they don't know by how much. Um, but they also expect more enterprise um, agreements to be entered into. I would have thought that it was pretty obvious you'd want to know, is the intention of the bill being met? And on that basis, one of our amendments requires an independent expert as soon as practicable after 12 months of royal assent to conduct a review. Uh, and on that basis, I commend my amendments to the Senate. Uh, Senator Mackenzie. Uh, before she finished talking. Get the leader gets precedence in the chamber. The leader of an opposition. No, she does not, apparently. Does she get precedence too? Excuse me. Excuse me. If we could just settle while we sort this out, I'll just seek advice from the clerks. All right. Senator McKenzie, there is precedence. If you could just resume your seat, Senator Hanson. There has been precedence, um, and Senator Hanson did call the other night, so I will call you. Thank you. Oh, sorry, Senator Hanson Young. My apologies, Senator Hanson Young. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Acting Deputy Speaker. As the Shadow Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development in this place, I rise to speak to the um, opposition amendments moved by Senator Cash. Sorry, Senator McKenzie, just resume your seat for one moment. Senator Hanson Young. Senator McKenzie, please. Thank you. Senator McKenzie. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm very, very concerned. As the Shadow Minister responsible, for building things and holding this government to account for building things, uh, hopefully only for three years, Senator Gallagher, but uh, we'll see how we go, that the abolition of the ABCC alone will add to delay and increase costs of infrastructure projects right across the country. Um, we know the master builders have done a study um, from Ernst Young calculating that in excess of $47.5 billion to 2030. That is a lot of hospitals. That is a lot of schools. 
And I know um, it's a lot of infrastructure, not just in capital cities, but right across rural and regional communities, uh, many of them rebuilding after devastating floods. And it'll be state and federal governments that will have to do the heavy lifting uh, when it comes to constructing and rebuilding and to have the infrastructure investment pipeline impacted to that amount of money over the next eight years, simply because the Labor Party has an ideological bent on removing the ABCC. I remember um, as a young backbencher—well, we'll just say younger—backbencher in this place in the Employment Committee, uh, we would have uh, Nigel Hadgkiss in front of us um, telling us of the horrific behaviour on construction sites right across the country, uh, day in, day out by the CFMEU, by the construction division. I'm, I'm not going to bag out the whole CFMEU. I quite like the forestry division. I find myself often on the same side as Mr Michael O'Connor and Raf. You and I uh, join hands and fight against our own Premier. Uh, Senator uh, McKenzie. Oh, through you, <laughs> Madam Chair. Um, <laughs> often find ourselves on the same side of an argument, standing up for the most renewable, sustainable primary industry in this country, and it is our forestry industry. So it's not the forestry division I have a problem with. It is the construction division, and it's not just me. We want to talk about poor culture in workplaces. We want to talk about poor culture in organisations. The, the negative, sexist, bullying culture of the construction division ain't a new thing. Let's face it. I come from Victoria. I'm old enough to remember the BLF. This We've seen this all before. And I find it passing strange that both the Greens and the Labor Party, who again talk a big game on the treatment of women, you talk a big game, you want respect in your workplace, but it's only for certain women in certain workplaces. It is not for all women and not all workplaces. Because if you did, Actually, actually believe that, you would keep in place the organisation that keeps a union like the CFMEU to account. Again, it's not for nothing that that's the union and the division of the CFMEU that's, you know, got a lot of court proceedings, had a lot of, you know, negative judgment calls. Not by the Liberal Party, not by the IPA, not by the National Party, but by courts, the judiciary in this country. And so for you to make it the first thing you guys just can't wait to get done before Christmas is to give John Sector a huge Merry Christmas. Sally McManus, you know, put the jingle bell on it. Merry Christmas, McManus. You're going to get your IR reform. You're going to allow, by the, ab absolving the ABCC, you are going to allow that negative, sexist culture back into construction sites across the country. You can carve it out of your multi-employer bargaining, but you know what? You're not going to change a thing for the women who might actually want to participate in this hypermasculine uh, industry. Right? Again, another another thing we often hear from. Uh, those opposite, arguing and lecturing us on hypermasculine um, workplaces of why don't you, you know, get some quotas about you, get some more chicks on your side. Well, after the Victorian election, I'm very, very proud to say the National Party, the most conservative party in this place, 50 uh, per cent of our parliamentarians, state and federal, are women, not a quota girl amongst us. So whilst you talk a big game, this was actually an organisation that would assist to make the construction industry safer for women to participate in. To be chippies, to be concreters, to be plumbers, to be sparkies. But that's not really what you're interested in, is it? You're not really interested in young women seeing a um, safe, um, successful, prosperous career in the construction industry. You're actually more interested in ensuring the negative culture that has pervaded that industry for so long 
is continued. And I just, of all, of all the ideologically driven decisions, the abolition of the ABCC just beggars belief. And as I said, it's because it's working. The millions of dollars that those guys are having to pay, the judgments from our courts is actually um, proof point that the construction division of that union is still not ready to accept men and women working in the same place and treating each other with respect. It's that simple. I also wanted to briefly um, contribute in the time left to me uh, around, and thank you for putting the clock on, Senator Hanson Young, uh, to small business. I represent rural and regional communities. They are the backbone of our communities. I'm not here to represent big business. And again, passing strange that the Labor Party, these will make it easier for big business to do big sweetheart deals with big unions. It's all very neatly wrapped up with a lovely bow, isn't it? You know who gets screwed over? Millions of small uh, business owners, their workers. Oh, that's probably not uh, parliamentary. I'll withdraw that Thank without you. even being asked. Thank you. Um, yes, it is. But it's true. It is absolutely true. What will happen? Because they don't care about small businesses. They think, they think a small business has 15 employees. Senator Pocock thinks a small business has 20 employees. That's not even a cafe in a country town, let alone the pub, let alone the hardware store. I mean, honestly, you need to get out of your capital cities and come out into the suburbs, come out into the working towns across this nation. Your small business minister, when questioned on this in the other place, couldn't even name a small business that you'd actually sat down and had a conversation with. How offensive! with the legislation you're bringing in that is going to severely impact their future prosperity, the prosperity of their families, their stress levels, because they don't have a HR department. You don't care, because this, isn't, this legislation isn't really about small businesses and their families and the mortgages that they have on houses to actually keep their businesses going. It's actually about making sure you pay back in spades, and I'm sure they'll be very, very grateful to the big unions who've delivered you the election uh, that you desire, who have funded you, funded you through you, Madam Chair, funded the Labor Party's election campaigns. And this is a very, very, very sweetheart deal for the unions, but it will have severe and significant consequences. And I just want to reiterate Senator Cash's comments. We are the Chamber of Review. It is actually our job to come in here and put on the record the questions of the people who can't be here. Who can't? I, I stand here representing rural and regional small businesses, construction workers, construction businesses. It is my job to ask you. Questions. It is my job uh, to actually hold you to account. And it might be a little annoying that on our big fat salaries in this place that we have to, you know, sit a little late sometimes when we're radically, fundamentally changing our industrial relations system without a mandate. We're just doing our job. And we want to make sure small businesses and their workers can continue Thank you, to do Senator theirs. McKenzie. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Chair. Well, Chair, I rise to speak in support of the amendments uh, proposed yeah. by Senator Cash and by the opposition. These are amendments that are fundamentally important to ensuring that the legislation put forward by the Labor Party is not legislation that ultimately ends up crippling parts of the economy, ultimately ends up driving up inflation ultimately ends up driving up industrial disputation and strikes. These are amendments that, uh, if adopted by this chamber, frankly, will help, will help the government in terms of uh, its legislation. Critically, aspects of these amendments would help the legislation also 
to be at least more consistent Correct. with what the government took to the election. So clearly there are a number of things that the opposition opposes in relation to this legislation. We have made that very clear all along. Indeed, we fought the election over that and we had fundamental differences when it came to issues such as the Rest Registered Organisations Commission and the ABCC. Fundamental differences. And we, those fundamental differences maintain, and it should be of no surprise to anybody that the Liberal and National parties would fight to argue, in particular in relation to the ABCC, uh, that it is an important cop on the beat in the building and construction sector, that it is a critical part of ensuring that Australia, in a building and construction sector uh, that already is full of hard-working men and women who also have a history in different sectors of having unions, particularly, of course, the CFMMEU, Shame. pursuing Shame. much pressure yep. on building sites, Shame. pressure in ways that at times has been called out by courts around this country, pressure in disgraceful behaviour, pressure that can lead to real dilution in terms of industrial activity yep. uh, and productivity on those building sites. So, of course, we stand by very, very clearly our position that the ABCC is an important, a critical cop on the beat, and that without it, and instead pretending to have some little committee that oversights things, which yes. essentially Correct. is what the government the has proposed as its deal, we'll, we'll have a committee yeah. rather than a cop on the beat. Yes. Well, without the ABCC, you'll end up risking a situation where, of course, the pressure on building sites is far, far greater. And in my state, these concerns oh, are is. very, very oh, high at present, yes. because the CFMMEU has been taken over by none other than John Setka. John Setka. Indeed, indeed, you can walk down King William Street, the main road through the centre of the Adelaide CBD, and see the trams going up and down the main road. And guess what's on the trams at present? Big CFMMEU advertising with a picture of John Setka on it. And I can only imagine what's going to happen on the building sites across South Australia thanks to, thanks to that advertising. And Senator Henderson rightly reminds me uh, indeed that, uh, that after some debate about the CFMMEU donations to the Labor Party in South Australia, can I play some credit that although there was an overwhelming lot of pressure that had to come to bear before Premier Peter Malinowskis Correct. did it, However, he did ultimately recognise yes, that government. such yep. is the appalling behaviour yes. of that union, yep. he gave the money back. So bad. He so gave bad. the money back. The South Australian branch of the Labor Party well ultimately well recognised yeah. that this union yep. is so appalling yep. it needed to give the money back. Uh, and so Birmingham concerned. Senator McKenzie, Senator Henderson and Senator Cash, you've got your own side up. Could you please just keep the interjections to a minimum? Well, I'm, I'm in the chair and I'm trying to hear. So thank you. Senator Birmingham. Oh, well, thanks. Uh, thank, thank, thank you, Chair. I, uh, I, I don't need protection from my own side, but, uh, or at least not on this question. It was about my being able to. Oh, hear. okay. Thank well, you. Thank, I, I apologise, Chair. The, uh, the President actually reflected earlier this week that, uh, that um, I'm quite easy to hear on occasion. <laughs> but I will, uh, I will seek to make sure my voice is such that I can rise above even my colleagues behind me. So, Chair, as, uh, as I was saying, I acknowledge that the South Australian Labor Premier has even recognised just how destructive the CFMMEU are and the association uh, between the Labor government in South Australia and that union was one that he wanted to detach and did detach by giving their money back. But, of course, it's not about political donations. It's about a crippling of the construction and building industry, exactly. and the that economy. is the fundamental the risk economy. there. The fundamental risk is that we see a situation where, without a cop, tough cop on the beat, and of course then with these other reforms the government is proposing, yep. the multi-employer bargaining reforms, we end up in a risky situation where increased incentive for industrial disputation, 
increased incentive for strike action, mm -hmm. all then piles onto a situation where you don't have an effective cop on the beat in the building and construction sector, and you end up with more strikes, with higher costs, with lower productivity, with building costs going through the roof. And guess what that will do? Inflation uh, goes up, correct. unemployment goes up, correct. job opportunities go down. These are the real risks of Labor's legislation. And worst of all, are essentially a couple of factors. One is that when it comes to multi-employer bargaining, the Labor Party went to the last election saying, we won't do it. Uh -oh. They went to the last election saying they wouldn't do it. And here we are, here we are, just six, seven months later, as they seek to push it through the parliament in what has been some of the fastest processes when it comes to substantive industrial relations reform that this country has seen. So they're seeking to ram it through, they drove it through with their numbers in the House of Reps, and unfortunately here we are in the Senate, and tragically it appears that they have the numbers. Well, I do appeal again to the crossbench, particularly to you, Senator Pocock, think again about the consequences. Think again about the consequences of the Labor Party breaking their faith with the Australian electorate, yep. proposing industrial relations reforms they yep. said they wouldn't do, and reforms that business organisations across the country have expressed their concerns about. So support, support the amendments put forward yeah, yeah. by my colleague Senator Cash, particularly those amendments that relate to multi-employer bargaining, because if you support those, you will be helping the Labor Correct. Party to ensure exactly. that they are acting in good faith with what they told the electorate. If you support all of these amendments in terms of maintaining the ROC, Correct. maintaining the ABCC, Correct. not imposing multi-employer bargaining, then you will be putting in place a situation that gives the economy the best chance to continue to grow strongly, that gives the best opportunity for us to see a situation where, with that economic growth, we get the type of wages growth we all wish to see. Correct. We all want to see wages growth. Correct. But you're not going to get sustainable wages growth in an environment where you have more strikes. You're not going to get sustainable wages growth in an environment where you have a weaker economy. You're not going to get sustainable wages growth in an environment where you have higher unemployment. To get sustainable wages growth, you need to make sure that you are driving, driving true productivity in a strong economy, in an environment with close to full employment. The Labor Party inherited, inherited an economy with effectively full employment. The big test over the next few, couple of years is to see whether they maintain that effective full employment. The lowest unemployment rate, Chair, in my lifetime is what the Labor government inherited from the coalition. That's something I'm very proud of, something I know Senator Cash is proud of and others are proud of on our side, that we delivered an economy that achieved the lowest rates of unemployment in our lifetimes. Not, and in addition to that, the highest levels of women's workforce participation, a closing of the gender pay gap, with a way to go, we absolutely acknowledge, but importantly, a closing of the gender pay gap with that record levels of women's workforce participation, with that record low in terms of the unemployment rate. They are things we are very proud of. They are achievements that we left, but most importantly, there are a legacy we left that this government has inherited. Correct. And the legislation before this Senate tonight risks all of that. It risks a situation where the economy in the future faces strike action as a result of more militant unions being empowered to take steps and actions that right now there is a cop on the beat, being incentivised to take those actions because they know that if they take positions in one business, they're able to leverage it into other businesses across a different industry sector. Uh, and so there's an incentive for unions to seek to drive not just through one set of negotiations, but across industries, the type oh, of action. Oh, come on, guys. You were going to get me Senator Birmingham, can you just resume That's your seat for one moment, please? Time is expired. Time has expired. For his contribution. Uh, so, sorry, Senator Birmingham, your time had expired. Um, Senator McKim.
Thank you, Chair. I move that the question now be put. So, so I'll go to this. Uh, so no, the question is that the question be put. The question is that the question. Oh, sorry, Senator Brockman. Can you just confirm, Chair, that this is an attempt to gag this debate when people have contributions? It's not a point of order, Senator Brockman. So the question is that the question be put. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. Aye. I think the ayes have it. No, have it. Those have it. Division required. Yes. Ring the bells. the doors. The question, order, order, the question, order. The question 
is that the amendments 1 to 9, 25 and 27, standing that, as moved by the opposition, be agreed to. No, no, no. no? The question is the question be put. Oh, sorry, no, my correction. I've made a mistake. Correction. The question is the question be put. Those for the question say aye. Oh, sorry, we've had a division. I'm actually getting my head. Those for the question move to the right of me. Those for the, against to the left of me. I appoint as teller for the ayes, Senator Shikoni, and teller for the noes, Senator Cadell.
Honourable Senators, there being 31 ayes and 30 noes, it's resolved in the affirmative. I put the question, which is the next question, that the amendments 1 to 9, 25 and 27 be agreed to. Those for the question say aye. aye. Against no. Aye. I think the noes have it. Is the division required? Ring the bells. Lock the doors. The question before the chair is that amendments 1 to 9, 25 and 27 be agreed to. Those for the question pass to the right of the chair. 
Noes, the left of the chair, I appoint Teller for the ayes, Senator Cadell. Teller for the noes, Senator Shikoni. One Teller. Hello, thank you. Hello. Hello. Yes, I've done. Honourable Senators, there being 27 ayes and 31 noes, it's passed in the negative. The question, now is... the question now is that parts 1, 3, 15, 22 and 23, Division 3 of Part 19, Divisions 2, 14, 16 and 17 in item 660, and Division 2 of Part 26 of Schedule 1, stand as printed and that parts 18, 20 and 21 of Schedule 2 stand as, printed, stand as amended. Those with the question say aye, against no. I think, I think the ayes have it. Is the division required? Ring the bells. It's one minute acceptable to the whips. One, one minute is acceptable to the whips. Bells ring for one minute. Lock the doors. Order. The question before the chair is that parts 1, 3, 15, 22 and 23, division 3 of part 19, divisions 2, 14, 16 and 17, in item 660 and division 2 of part 26 of schedule 1 stand as printed and that parts 18, 20 and 21 of schedule 2 stand as amended. Those for the those with the question pass to the right of the chair, nose to the left of the chair. I appoint as teller for the eyes, Senator Chacon, and teller for the nose, Senator Cadell. One teller. Hello. Oh,
Honourable Senators, there being 31 ayes and 27 noes, it's resolved in the affirmative. Are there any other amendments to be moved? Senator Cash. Uh, thank you. And I rise to move opposition amendments 17 to 20 on sheet 1779 by leave together. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Uh, thank you. In relation to this particular amendment, uh, the amendment in relation to actually removing multi-employer bargaining from the bill, it failed. So what we seek to do with this amendment is to at least give a few more businesses in Australia a chance not to be compelled into multi-employer bargaining. So these amendments would change to 200 the number of employees a business employs before multi-employer bargaining is able to be authorised. Now, why will we do that? Because what we are doing is, by expanding the figure, we can protect medium businesses, those with 200 or less employees in their business, from being dragged onto single interest agreements, which the government's and this is very interesting, the government's own regulatory impact statement states will actually cost between $80,000 and $95,000 for these businesses. That's right. The actual regulatory impact statement that the government has done itself has the cost as between $80,000 and $90,000 for medium businesses. So why do we say though, that this change is necessary? Well, currently, businesses with as few as 20 employees could pay over $80,000 when they are forced to or compelled into multi-employer bargaining. Now, the issue I actually have in any event with this figure is obviously the way in which the department determined it. Because, as we know, throughout the Senate hearings and throughout the committee process, uh, when looking at actually how the department came to the figure of $80,000, they came up with a figure of $175 per hour for consultants. But the issue we then have in relation to that is they actually merely utilised a Google search engine. How much should I charge as a consultant in Australia to estimate how much a business in Australia will have to pay per hour for this consultant that they are going to take on board? The issue again, though, I have is when you actually go to the biography of this particular person, uh, it is quite strange because uh, he identifies with all sorts of things, shamans, uh, those who meditate, uh, magicians, etc. But what the, what the one thing this person didn't have was actually industrial relations experience in Australia. We have just made some fundamental changes, or we're about to make, to the industrial relations system in Australia. And the department, in determining the costs that will be borne by each business in Australia, whether it's a small business being compelled into the supported bargaining stream, a medium-sized business or a large business, has merely used a search engine term, how much should I charge as a consultant in Australia, to come up with the $175 per hour, which is actually what this website actually recommends. If you choose to triple your hourly salary-based wage, your consulting rate will be about $175 per hour. So that's a pretty intense formula there, colleagues, a pretty intense formula. What's even more interesting, though, is once obviously this was exposed, the department were thrown under a bus and they had to issue a statement saying, no, 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 we actually utilised other sources, um, which is a little strange again, though, because the other sources clearly were in contact with the shaman involved uh, in this particular website because the shaman had said to them the cost per hour for a consultant in Australia is $175. Because, colleagues, do you not find it a little strange? It is spooky that the department have thrown under a bus and told to come out with a statement that says we utilised other sources. But the problem is the source that is actually quoted in the regulatory impact statement actually does have the figure of $175, which is actually the figure that this particular website, how do I actually, uh, how much should I charge a consultant in Australia? So again, 
Magical things are happening in the chamber with the shaman, and perhaps that's just one of them. One of the other concerns, though, in relation to being compelled into um, a multi-employer agreement is in terms of the estimation and the impact on employers, the estimation of time spent by bargaining each day in the regulatory impact statement. They've actually gone and looked at that, the department, and they've actually come up with the time spent by staff on bargaining per day is 4.6 hours per day per bargaining period for an employer. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't know what business with 21 employees has 4.6 hours per day to actually dedicate to the bargaining period. The bargaining period could be, say, 31 days. So 4.6 hours per day they now have to give up uh, on top of everything else that they are doing. Now, that doesn't matter. 21 employees, 22 employees, 23 employees, they are all in at the moment. They are all in. What small business in Australia a, has a cost, has, has, has $14,500—or actually, in this case, it's actually $80,000, sorry, it's $80,000—that they can actually just put aside, given rising interest rates, given rising inflation, given rising power prices. Apparently, also, they actually just have $80,000 that they can put aside for when they're compelled into multi-employer bargaining. But the money would appear to be the least of their worries, because at the same time they've got to put aside 4.6 hours per day uh, per bargaining period for an employer. So again, this is all about recognising that it is the businesses and the employers in Australia that actually create the jobs. And all this is doing is actually adding another layer of red tape on them. It is saying to them the primacy of the relationship, negotiating at an enterprise level between you and your employee to get the best outcome for both you and your employee based on what is best for your business so that your business continues to function, your business continue, can continue to be productive and you can have a good relationship with your employees is all about to be taken away from you and handed over to the one-size-fits-all approach of the centralised wage fixer. So all this amendment does, all this amendment does, is recognise that businesses are the job creators in Australia. They have told us they have stood united, and they have said this is not good legislation. They have said we all want wage rises in this country, we all want wage rises, but they have pleaded with the government. This legislation is not the way to do it. This legislation will only result in more strikes and less jobs. When you have more strikes, your productivity goes down. When your productivity goes down as a business, it is likely to result in people losing jobs. So when the employers of Australia stand up and say, we do want to achieve wage rises for our employees, but this legislation is not the way you do it, if you don't want to listen to them, and I accept, I accept that the Albanese government doesn't want to listen to them, but what I would say, at least then make the legislation slightly better by raising the threshold and change the number from 20 to 200 in recognition of the fact that they are the job creators in Australia. They don't need to be lumbered with this additional 80,000 cost. They don't need to be lumbered with the 4.6 hours per day per bargaining period. Uh, and on that basis, I would commend my amendment to the chamber. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Chair. Chair, colleagues, multi-employer bargaining is the most controversial the most risky and the most disputed aspect of these industrial relations reforms being brought forward by the Albanese government. It's controversial in part because, of course, they said they wouldn't do it before the last election, uh, but it is risky and disputed because of the genuine concerns that businesses across Australia have. Now, I say in support of this amendment say it to the crossbench, to the Greens, even to the Labor Party. If you are persuaded to give multi-employer bargaining a go, yep. then do this. start small. Correct. Start carefully. Exactly. And by saying start small, well, I don't mean start with the small, small businesses. businesses. 
I mean start with a small part of the Australian business community and see whether the concerns that businesses have expressed are upheld or not. If they're not, well then maybe you can come back and say it wasn't as bad as they feared and we can extend it elsewhere into the economy. But if those concerns are upheld, then if you've started with a smaller cohort of the Australian economy, the impacts of your reforms will be less in terms of the detriment and harm caused. So this amendment seeks to give a pathway for that. It's a change that, in the negotiations that have occurred with the crossbench, should have been embedded, rather than the tiny shift from 15 employees to 20 employees, mm -hmm. the tiny shift in headcount, which for many small businesses who employ large numbers of casuals working across seven days, long hours, particularly in sectors like hospitality and retail, it makes almost no difference to shift the qualification from 15 to 20. This would ensure fundamentally small businesses across Australia are exempt from this risky, contested part of Labor's IR reforms. To shift it to 200, noting that it's still headcount, so this is, this is not FTEs we're talking about. The 15 was not FTEs, the 20 is not FTEs, the 200 is not FTEs. In each case, they are headcount. And because it's headcount, it means that a young student at school who might just work one shift a week counts towards, counts towards the total. You can have several of those working in a busy retail environment or a busy hospitality environment, and that's a good thing, and we shouldn't seek to discourage it. But your laws will seek to discourage that. Because if I'm an employer who wants to stay exempt from multi-employer bargaining, then I'm going to do my utmost to come in below the headcount. And so having a headcount at a small number like 20 means you can work carefully to avoid that. It might mean you have to work more hours yourself. Your family might work more hours. You, of but course, bring on other staff, but you will deprive, particularly those young Australians looking for the part-time and the casual opportunities while they're studying, you'll deprive them of the opportunities because businesses will manage their headcount to come in under those numbers. So by adopting this amendment, the Senate would be not wrecking Labor's reforms, no, no, but safeguarding them in the way in which they could apply across the economy. And why does it need safeguarding? Well, not just because it's contested, but because of the reasons why it's contested, as my colleague Senator Cash has indicated. Because the government's own regulatory impact statement indicates the costs for these businesses of being dragged into a bargaining process that they weren't wanting to go into could be around, according to the RIS, some $80,000, according to the government's regulatory impact statement. That's just the direct costs. Of course, the indirect costs are so much more. As Senator Cash has indicated, the costs in terms of time for an employer to be dragged into that process. The 4.6 hours per day estimated under the RIS, running over the course of a month, all adding up. If you're running a small business, time is money. Correct. Time is money. Exactly. So you've got the direct costs, Correct. you've got the indirect costs for a process that you didn't ask to be in in the first place, but that under these laws you are being dragged into. Then, of course, there's the credibility, or more to the point, the lack of credibility that underpins those costs and assessments. The fact that the government has formed these costs and assessments on the basis of analysis from a consultant found from a Google search who, it turns out, is a psychic or a shaman. Well, you don't have to be a psychic or a shaman to know that this bill will cause harm to small businesses across the economy. You don't have to be a psychic or a shaman to know that this bill will see small businesses more reluctant to employ Australians, especially young Australians. That's the harm we seek to avert and avoid in proposing this amendment, to ensure that young Australians aren't cut out of 
employment opportunities by small businesses but are given the maximum opportunity to be employed. As you know and as we've explained, we have concerns about the whole process of multi-employer bargaining, as many businesses have raised and business organisations have raised. We have concerns about it because it ropes businesses in to processes and bargaining arrangements that are, may not actually fit those businesses, for which they don't get to have a say about being roped in under the conditions proposed by the government. And by creating that type of situation, you run the risk, as I said in the earlier contribution to the previous amendments, you run the risk of seeing increased strike action across Australia, increased industrial disputation, outcomes that of course would see weakened productivity across the Australian economy, weakened outcomes in terms of those businesses, and you weaken, and weaken businesses and create those outcomes, you end up in a circumstance where you have businesses employing fewer Australians, higher unemployment, lower job opportunities, and when that all occurs, you're not going to have the type of sustainable wages growth that we all say we want, but it's misguided to go about it in this case and in this way. So trying to impose one-size-fits-all, rope businesses in type solutions is certainly not the way. Indeed, if you look at the most recent wages data, if you look at the most recent wages growth data, it is through individual agreements and negotiations that the country has seen the fastest rates of wage growth. So we know that the more granular you make the negotiations on the current wages data, the faster the wages growth you actually achieve and secure. So that's speaking facts, it's speaking to the data, it's a demonstration that far from going for a more collectivist approach to bargaining and negotiating that the Labor government is pursuing, you should be backing maximum incentive for individual negotiations. Individual negotiations, indeed, for individuals or at least sticking to the enterprise level, the individual enterprise, a small business as a small business having those rights to negotiate. We are fortunate to be in a country in which we have strong safeguards and flaws that underpin industrial structures. They're called awards. They're called awards. They exist there so that if businesses don't wish to negotiate, the floor is in place. Now, of course, many, many businesses, most businesses, pay above those awards. They do so already. They do so in a range of different ways, but the floor and the safeguard is there, and it is not necessary to drag them into these alternate processes. So, Chair, I do implore the Chamber and the government think again about the threshold at which a business is dragged into multi-employer bargaining. If you want to give it a go, give it a go at a, at a safeguard level that doesn't expose small businesses across Australia to this experiment that your government is pursuing. Because small businesses right now are facing a tonne of pressures. The energy, cri the energy price crisis that many businesses are facing is a huge impost on them. The inflationary pressures they're facing is a huge impost on them. The last thing they can afford right now is to find the inner situation with extra industrial pressures, extra disputation in their workplace, unions coming through the door, demanding that they engage in processes that they didn't even want to sign up to in the first place. But if you insist, if you insist on going ahead, then safeguard the small businesses of this country by supporting this amendment that simply shifts the threshold from the 15 the government originally proposed, the miserly increase to 20 headcount negotiated with Senator Pocock, up to 200 that would ensure small businesses of all shapes and sizes at least are protected somewhat under these reforms. Senator Sullivan. Thank you very much. Uh, <coughs> thank you, thank you, Chair. Oh, uh, sorry. Uh, it is it is evident yeah, that got my uh, it is evident that this last couple of days, what we've seen is the jump. impact that this bill is going to have on who, small business. Who was it that jumped? Now, I'm Deputy Chair of the Education and Employment Committee, and we heard time and time again. In fact, it didn't take the full 22 days. That, I mean, we weren't given much time. Sorry, we were only given 22 days to inquire into this bill. It didn't actually take very long before we could hear and really get to see the impact that was going to be had on small business. We, we could see that from the very outset. 
as soon as we started to hear is the, the gravity of what was going on was started to be felt across businesses across Australia. We started to hear it loud and clear what an impact that this bill will have. Because there's no doubt that it's the small businesses in Australia that are going to bear the brunt of this bill. But you know the reality is this government doesn't understand small business. They don't actually understand uh, the impact that this bill will actually have on small business. They might understand what it means for the union movement and the, the access that the unions will get into businesses that they otherwise wouldn't have had access to before. They understand that. They certainly understand that. You know, 1st of December is the first day of summer. Well, guess what? 1st of December is the payday for the union movement because we know that they're going to get greater access to small businesses. We know that with the abolition of the ABCC, the, 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 um, the costs that were, that were awarded are not going to be pursued by, by the, the Fair Work Commission. They don't have the power to do that. There's payday for the unions, those that were awarded costs. They're not going to be pursued. We know it's payday for them, but for small businesses, this is going to cost them. There's going to be a big impost upon small businesses across Australia. Now, this government has been drawn into uh, getting some amendments through. Uh, we've seen uh, the lifting, the threshold of, of businesses that are included versus those that are not from 15 to 20. Like, what do you do? 20. Like, as if the, the impost on business, if you got 20, you know, with the, this, apparently this lot understand that if you're a small business with a 20 head count, uh, that's, that's, you, know, you won't be able to afford the $14,500 in, 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 in having to hire in these consultants, these $175 an hour so-called uh, consultants. You, 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 they, there's an acceptance on this side that, that businesses with 20 head count or less won't, won't be able to afford it. But if you've got 21, guess what? That's all good. That's all good. You, you can afford it. You can afford the $14,500 that you're going to have to pay. But that $14,500, let's face it, it's pretty rubbery, wasn't it? Like, pretty rubbery. I mean, it was just based on the, the clairvoyant or the, the crystal ball or, or the, the shaman or the magician that sort of worked it out. I mean, it was a bit of a miraculous sort of thing. Maybe this lot does believe in miracles. Because, because see, what happened is, is the, the RIS says that it's exactly $175, exactly. yet we heard the minister come in to the chamber last week when he was asked a question about this, and he said, oh, there was actually a bit of a mistake. It, it shouldn't have pointed out just that one source. It was multiple sources. The minister, Minister Watt, came in here and he said that we're, they also used payscale.com to come up with that figure. They also used the AFR, the AFR, who are a reputable organisation. They, they came... You know, that, that's where they were, that, they're the sources that they relied on to come up with $175. Well, isn't it interesting that when you go to authentic.com.au, the exact figure, the exact figure that's on that website that Senator Cash was reading out before was exactly $175. Wow, what a what a crystal ball. I mean, can someone get that, can someone get that, that crystal so ball? Because maybe you could use it to predict, predict who's going to win the World Cup. Maybe you could use it to predict who's going to win the World Cup this year. Hopefully it will be Australia. I mean, that, that could be a chance. That could be a chance with the way we're going so far. But this lot, I mean, come on. It's, if it wasn't so ridiculous, uh, you know, if it wasn't so ridiculous, then, then maybe we'd be having a, a, a serious think about this. I mean, this is absolutely crazy. Now, in my home state, 97 per cent of businesses there are small businesses. 97 per cent of small businesses in Western Australia are uh, uh, they're small businesses. They're, they're going to be caught up with the impact of this bill. Now, in the, I'm, I'm, we have a, an arrangement amongst our, us West Australian senators, Senator Brockman's here, Senator Cash here from Western Australia. We, we have an arrangement. We have what we call patron seats, and one of my patron seats is the seat of Tangney, a uh, great part of Perth. And, uh, there are 6,500 small businesses in the seat of Tangney. 6,500 small businesses in the seat of Tangney. You go through places like Canning Vale, uh, through around Williton, Senator Brockman knows these places. Many, many small businesses. Now, I bet you the telephone 
has been running hot in the electorate of the member for Tangney. The, I, I bet the, the, that Mr Lim over there is getting inundated with businesses who are just trying to actually figure out what this is going to mean for his business. What is this going to mean for their businesses? People that are just busy trying to actually keep their businesses afloat. Now, anyone that's been involved in and around small businesses, for a short time I ran my own small businesses. I was running as a consultant. Like it's tough. You've got, you got, you got to work it out. Where's the next paycheck coming from? Where's your next client coming from? Are people going to pay on time? All of these factors are, are considered by a small business. Now, you don't want to be also wondering, you know, are you going to get caught up in some industrial relations dispute with a, maybe a bigger business, maybe a competitor that's in your industry, maybe a competitor that's under the same roof, the shopping centre that you're in, or the suburb that you're in, or the, 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 the common interest, or whatever it is. I mean, we, we heard through the excellent, excellent questioning by Senator Catch uh, last night and, and this morning that uh, uh, you know, when we're just seeking to understand what are the, the guardrails you know, to actually determine uh, which businesses are going to be in, which businesses are going to be out, you know, what's the definition, Who, who's going to be included in this? We just heard, well, it's up to the discretion of the, no the, up to the, discretion of the no Fair guardrails. Work Commission. So it's just going to be, we're just going to leave it up to them. Well, what if you're the small business that's trying to determine how you're going to make this work? And I've got no doubt that, that uh, Mr Lim, the, the, the member for Tangney, will, will be inundated with people questioning him. But apparently this government thinks that there's no difference between a uh, business that's got a 20 people in it versus those that have got 200 people in it, uh, or 21 even. Well, guess what? There's a big difference. There's a big difference. And, and when you're trying to pull it together, it, it's, it's tough going. Now my daughter, she's she's 16. She's only working casually for an employer uh, in retail, and guess what? She's got a regular pattern of work because she works every single Saturday, every single Saturday. It's a great job that she's got. It's a great job that she's got, and she's learning a lot in that job. She's getting experience. It's setting her up, and you know when she start, goes on to study, it will help her through that uh, through that through her study when she when she finishes school next year. But but but. Yeah, it doesn't take much. It's not actually a very big business to get lots of casuals in that sort of environment, particularly in a casual in a in a retail workplace. So you might think, oh, tw 20 employees is a big business. 20 employees is a is a is a big organisation. Well, guess what? For particularly those that are in that sort of sector where you employ people for those those shifts during the week when there's a uh, you know, a bit of a surge because it's a Saturday, and you want to have, you know, be able to be, be have the headcount to be able to support the customers that are coming in there. You, you you might hire those people just for that day, and just but you need them every Saturday. So there's a regular pattern of work. Well, those businesses are going to be caught into this. They're going to be caught into this. But let me tell you, running a business like that is actually really tough. It's actually really tough. And the last thing you want to be thinking about is whether or not you're going to get caught up in this union attracting situation that's just about trying to get people unions involved when you're just trying to run your business and make ends meet and you know what when you're a small business person you're often the last person to get paid you're often the last person to get paid because you know that it's tough going but the problem is this side over here this lot over here supported by the government the government of Australia absolutely I, I don't deny that you guys might think you're—I don't know what you think. You think you're just the masters of business, do you? You think you listen. No, they still think they're union. Supported officials. by the Greens, supported by Senator Pocock, yeah. this legislation is going to get through tonight, and Australians know, and particularly those that are in small businesses know, that they're the ones that are going to bear the cost of this. I'll have to give the call to Senator. Well. No, I've just read the, the rules of the debate, and I well, I. It depends on what Sarah Hansi Young stands to do, according to the precedent here. Hmm? Senator Hanson Young, I'm seeking the call. Yeah. Yes, 
Okay, what's your point of order, Senator McKenzie? Mark is reading you. There is an order of precedence, and as leader of the National Party, I'm seeking the call. Would the government like to seek the call? Senator McKenzie. Thank you so much, Madam Acting Deputy President. And I rise to full, give my full support to uh, this amendment. I, as I've said often in this chamber over the last 12 years, I've had the great pleasure and misfortune to grow up uh, in a small business family. Uh, there was no Fair Work Commission uh, that was looking after me as a 12-year-old on the back of my father's one-ton truck delivering milk around a small country town uh, in the 70s and 80s. But I learnt a lot, <laughs> I learnt a lot from that experience, the importance of hard work, um, the stress of owning a small business, uh, of being owner-operators and having everything on the line, everything on the line for the success of that small business, and the stress of um, Oh, Se Senator Hanson Young, I can talk for the full ten, or you can let me have my say, and you can do what you need to do tonight for this amendment. But the, the thought that senators here who will not support this amendment think that a small business with 200 headcount on the books is somehow the fat cats, the big end of town, again just shows the failed consultation process this government has gone through to bring us to this place tonight. The fact that, you're, again, your own small business minister can't name one small business she's actually talked to. She's talked to a lot of unions. She's talked to a lot of organisers. She's talked to a lot of associations representing people. But as she bothered to even walk down her main street and go, you know what? Here I am. I think she's from Tasmania. Uh, here I am in Main Street, Hobart. How are things going for you post-COVID? Uh, how many people do you actually employ? Are you a big business? How will the decisions that we're putting before the Senate today impact your ability to grow and prosper and employ more people and pay them more money? But the fact that this uh, legislation before us is going to call businesses you know, with 21 employees paying over $80,000 when they're forced into multi-employer bargaining is incredible. I mean, what margins do you think these families are on? Because you know, we weren't the rich family in town. Most small businesses, the news agent isn't the rich family in town. Uh, the pharmacist, they're a bit richer, but they're not the huge fat cats that you're thinking they are. And the fact that this Senate thinks that uh, 21 businesses that employ 21 people are the big end of town is just quite incredible. It just shows how out of touch you are. But it's not too late. It's not too late. And I, I was really buoyed by Senator Birmingham's contribution. It is not too late for the Labor Party. It's not too late for the Greens, although, given who they uh, represent in this place, you know, they do represent the big end of town and the big unions. But, Senator Pocock, it's not too late to understand that small businesses are larger than 20 employees. And the risk of this legislation and the unintended consequences, because Labor hasn't actually talked to anyone, are huge, and particularly in the high inflationary environment we're in at the moment, the energy crisis uh, that small businesses are facing uh, means that people should remember the first principle um, of government, and it's actually to do your very best to do no harm. And the fact that you haven't consulted, and the fact that you have quite inner city views on what constitutes a small business and what doesn't and what uh, level of impact they can actually bear is quite incredible. Uh, I know uh, Senator O'Sullivan briefly touched on the spiritual healer's contribution to uh, constructing the figures here before the chamber. Yeah, 
Yes, Senator Pillick, the spiritual healers. I know you don't like to hear it, but the riz was clear, and it was disclosed by Senator Cash's forensic uh, examination of this bill in the short time we've had and the short Senate inquiry we had into the most radical industrial relations reform for decades um, was actually a spiritual healer that actually informed the RIS. I just find it quite depressing, actually, that you'd want, you want to see the economy grow, you want to see workers paid more. We all do. But you don't do that by roping in small businesses with a headcount of 21 to be coming up with a lazy 80 grand, because it's just not there for them. And it shows immaturity, naivety and a complete lack of engagement with millions of families around this country who actually run the joint who have the guts to get up every morning and put the whole thing on the line, their house, their family's future, to run a small business. And the entrepreneurial spirit that they display day in, day out is incredible. Um, I really recommend this amendment. It's a simple amendment. It adjusts the headcount um, to a more appropriate level. There are multiple definitions that government uses on what defines a small business, 21 ain't it, um, and I would recommend this uh, amendment to the Senate. Senator Hanson Young. Well, she's been waiting for the call. She's indicated she has indicated twice. I am quite happy to give you the call. Thank you. Point of order, I'm seeking some guidance from, mm -hmm. from the chair, which is that, um, that it is normal practice that senators are usually called from each side of the chamber alternately. Alternately. Well, Sarah Hans Senator Hanson Young has indicated on three occasions that she would like the call and it has stayed over this side of the chamber. So my argument, Chair, mm. is that it should alternate. The call that, goes that is the practice. Yeah explicitly identified in Odgers in Chapter 10 and that, that the call should go to Senator Hanson Young. This side of the chamber have had Senator Birmingham, Senator Cash, Senator McKenzie and now Senator Henderson wants the call. That is hardly fit. And Senator O'Sullivan. So that's five without going to this side of the chamber. The call should go to Senator Hanson Young. What's your point of order, Senator Henderson? Yes, That's what we have speaking lists for as well, and we're in committee. Senator Hanson Young, you have the call. I move that the question be put. I have a point of order over here. Order. Uh, what is your point of order, Senator Brockman? On the existing point of order, you are effectively ruling here that standing in the chamber is no longer relevant. This is no. that Senator Hanson Young was not on her feet. Senator Henderson and I were both on our feet. Senator Hanson Young has flagged that she is about to shut down debate on an open-ended sitting. On an open-ended sitting, okay. I would I would ask you. Okay. So, so the the point of order. I've listened to them, and they're not valid points of order from the point of view that I am required to distribute the call fairly, and that Sarah Senator Hanson Young uh, had been seeking the call on three occasions. I ask senators to take their seat while I am speaking. Sit down while I'm speaking. It is my obligation to distribute the call fairly. I distributed the call to Senator Sullivan previously when it should have come to this side of the chamber at that point in time. Senator Hanson Young did stand and seek the call at about the same time as Senator Sullivan. The previous chair here, Senator, uh, Senator McLaughlin, had 
advised me that Senator Sullivan was seeking the call, which is why I gave him the call without, without seeing Senator Hanson Young. And frankly, on exactly that same basis, I can give the call to Senator Hanson Young. I have ruled on the point of order, and Senator Hanson Young has the call. I move that the question be put. The question is that the question be put. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against no. no. I think the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells. You can't do that in it. Okay. What is your point of order, Senator Brockman? My, um, I, I, it, it, I would ask for a written uh, explanation from the president to the opposition. Okay, I can give you another your... explanation no, no, now, no. which was that I gave Senator no. Sullivan the call I'm asking... based on him not jumping, based I'm... on the fact that the previous chair had given me his name. Chair, with due respect, I'm, I'm not dissenting from your ruling. I'm okay. asking for a written explanation from the president to the opposition on that ruling and whether that is consistent with past practice. If there's anything inconsistent, the president will come back to the chair. I can advise that if there is anything inconsistent, you can be confident that the president will come back to the chamber. Lock the doors. The question is 
before the chair that the question be put. Those for the question pass to the right of the chair, nose to the left of the chair. I point as teller for the eyes, Senator Urquhart, teller for the nose, Senator O'Sullivan. Honourable Senators, there being 32 ayes and 29 noes, it's resolved in the affirmative. I now put the question that the amendments on sheet 1799, 17 to 20, as moved by the opposition, be agreed to. Those for the question say aye. aye. Against no. Aye. I think the noes have it. Aye. So, sorry. One seven seven nine. Yeah. I thought you said one seven nine. So, sorry, if I did, it was a mistake. It's one seven seven nine. Right. So I've now called it. Uh, yeah. Okay. I'll put, I'll put the question again. The question is that the amendments on sheet one seven seven nine, seventeen to twenty, be agreed to. Those for the question say aye. Aye. Against no. I think the noes have it. Is a division required? Ring the bells. Is one minute acceptable? One minute. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. The question before the chair is that the amendments on sheet 1779, 17 to 20, be agreed to. Those for the question pass to the right of the chair, no to the left of the chair. I point teller for the aye, Senator O'Sullivan, and teller for the no, Senator Urquhart.
Well, Senators, there have been 28 ayes and 32 noes. It's passed in a negative. is in terms of making it slightly better for the small businesses who are not actually exempt from this part of the Act. Small businesses, the definition of small business being a group of Senator Pocock, I don't agree with, but 20 employees are under, um, they are exempt from the multi-employer bargaining part of the Act, the single interest frame expansion. They are not actually exempt from other changes in the Act. And one of the other changes in the Act is in relation to uh, the flexibility, the rights for flexibility. So this amendment is all about ensuring that employers are not unfairly bound by a decision of the Fair Work Commission relating to workplace flexibility when the circumstances of their businesses change. Because currently, under the Fair Work Act, there are minimal ways for the Fair Work Commission to intervene in flexible work arrangements made under section 65 of the Act. And if COVID-19 has taught us a few things, what it has taught us in particular is that employers and employees are able to work with one another to ensure that they can properly put in place flexible working arrangements that actually suit both parties. This, although, actually changes under the Act, because the Act now introduces a right to arbitration. So what will now happen under the Act is if the employer and the employee are unable to agree on a particular working arrangement, there now will be the right for the Fair Work Commission to actually intervene and actually arbitrate a decision on behalf of the employer and the employee. 17, 17. What is not then provided for in the Act is the ability for a business to request a review after a binding decision is made by the Commission. Because what may well happen, and at the rate we're going, if you are seeing rising interest rates, if you are seeing rising inflation, if you are seeing uh, electricity prices literally skyrocketing and getting out of control, the decision of the Fair Work Commission, made in particular circumstances and then imposed on the business, may no longer be fit for purpose in terms of the current circumstances. So all this amendment does, Senator Pocock, it's a very simple amendment, is actually ensure that there is a right for the business to request a review after a binding decision of the Commission has been made. That's all it does. The amendment ensures that this becomes possible for a business to revisit a decision on flexible working arrangements. So this will actually mean that if a business suffers a change in circumstances, and businesses do suffer change in circumstances, they will have access to review um, of any determination made by the Fair Work Commission um, in relation to their business. This, I would put to the chamber, is abundantly fair, but in particular for those smaller businesses um, who may have less ability to actually keep a flexible working arrangement just because of the nature of their operations. But in particular, 
if their circumstances change. As I said, it is a very simple amendment. It doesn't take away what's actually passed through the Senate tonight. All it does is just give businesses that ability to actually request a review after a binding decision is made by the Commission to ensure that the terms and conditions that they work under continue to be fit for purpose for the business that they're in. Senator Gallagher. I move that the question be put. I put the que I put the I put the question that the question be put. Those for the question say aye. aye. Against no. no. I think the ayes have it. No, it's vision required. Yes. Ring the bells. The only one then left is Jackie Lamb Network. And then
Look for the no, Senator O'Sullivan. Honourable Senator, there being 33 ayes and 29 noes, it's resolved in the affirmative. We're ready to go. Out. So the question is that Amendment 1 on 1756 be agreed? Okay. 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 Question is that Amendment 1 on 1756 be agreed. I put the question that uh, Amendment on 1 on, on sheet 1756 be agreed to. Those for the question say aye. aye. Against no. no. I think the noes have it. Is a vision required? One, one minute. One minute. One minute. Ring the bells. Lock the doors. The question before the chair is that the amendment number one on sheet 1756 be agreed to. Those for the question pass to the right of the chair, nose to the left of the chair. I appoint teller for the ayes, uh, Senator O'Sullivan. Teller for the nose, Senator Urquhart. Wong, Brown, 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 Brown,
Honourable Senators, there have been 29 ayes and 32 noes. It's passed in the negative. Uh, Senator Cash. And I rise to move what I understand, unless the Jackie Lambie Network make an appearance, will be the last amendment uh, to be moved tonight. And I rise to move Opposition Amendment 1 to 6 on sheet 1773 by leave together. It's leave granted. Leave is granted. And again, as Senator Birmingham has already stated tonight, multi employer bargaining is going through tonight and it will go through shortly the Australian Senate. What this amendment does is in some small way addresses the concerns that have been raised by business after business after business around Australia. And it's in relation to the common interest test. When I actually question the ministers, the various ministers that passed through the chamber in relation to the committee stage of this bill, what I was looking for by way of statutory interpretation going forward is some guidance in relation to what the common interest is. The common interest, as we know, is based on three particular tests. It could be a geographic location, it could be a regulatory uh, location, um, businesses in the same sector or industry. But there is no other guidance given in this legislation to the Fair Work Commission in determining what the common interest is. So, for example, when you look at the geographic location, putting simple questions to the minister just to get some form of guidance, some form of guidance for employers who may be compelled into multi-employer bargaining. If two businesses are in the same shopping centre, do they share the same geographical location? I would have thought I could get some type of indication from the minister, but the answer to the question was that is for the Fair Work Commission to decide. It's left to the discretion of the Fair Work Commission. So, depending on the commissioner you get, I hope you don't end up getting a different answer. Next question I put to the minister. Could a hardware store next to a hairdresser, so they're right next door to each other in the shopping centre, be compelled to bargain together under the geographic location common interest test? Again, I would have thought there was a simple explanation, yes or no, that does fit within the geographic uh, location test. But again, the answer was that is left to the discretion of the Fair Work Commission. We then proceeded to uh, go down a line of questioning just in relation to distance. If two businesses are within one kilometre of each other, do they share a geographic location under the common interest test? Again. That is left to the discretion of the Fair Work Commission. So then just a basic question, if we can't determine based on one kilometre or right next door to each other, is there a distance limit for the geographical location test? So for example, do the employers need to at least be in the same suburb? Again, I would have thought that is a pretty easy question uh, when asking for guidance in relation to uh, a test that if you pass, uh, you actually leap over a hurdle and you're one step closer to being compelled into multi-employer bargaining. But again, the answer was it is left to the discretion of uh, the Fair Work Commission. Uh, question after question after question. Could any two retail stores be considered as having the same nature, another part of the common interest test? You guessed it. It's left to the discretion of the Fair Work Commission. So a butcher and a news agency are both retail stores. Would they be considered as having the same nature? Again, it's left to the discretion of the Fair Work Commission. 
Would two businesses in the mining sector be considered as having the same nature, even if their activities are substantially different? I would have thought a little bit of guidance, perhaps, in relation to uh, that part of the common interest test. But again, there was certainly a theme going in um, terms of all of the answers. That is left to the discretion of the Fair Work Commission. So again, all this amendment seeks to do, all this amendment seeks to do, is make it clear the factors which see employers bargain together are more clearly defined. That is all this amendment achieves. So when the question is posed, would any two retail stores be considered as having the same nature? A butcher and a news agency are both retail stores. Would they be considered as having the same nature? There are actually a number of factors to the common interest test that the Fair Work Commission would have to take into account. All they are is the history of bargaining of each of the relevant employers, including whether they've previously bargained together, the interests that the relevant employers have in common, the extent to which those interests are relevant to whether they should be permitted to bargain together, whether it would be more appropriate for each of the relevant employers to make a separate enterprise agreement with its employees. All we're doing is providing some signposts for the Commission in terms of undertaking what is, quite frankly, a decision that could or could not see a business in Australia 20 or more, 21 or more, roped into uh, multi-employer bargaining. Um, Senator Gallagher. Uh, the government opposes these amendments. Uh, these laws are designed to give the Fair Work Commission a reasonable amount of discretion. The amendments proposed would add so much red tape that they would make the provisions impenetrable, which is perhaps the uh, reason behind the amendments. Which is what happened to the low-paid stream, so much red tape that no one could get into it. Only four applications and none since 2014. This amendment is not going to fix our broken bargaining system, adding more and more criteria. We have designed these provisions to stop the race to the bottom on wages. We want to see businesses competing on quality, innovation and ideas. We do not want them to compete on wages. This is why we need to give the Fair Work Commission the discretion to decide which employers it is appropriate to bargain together. And on the broader part of the discussions that we've been having tonight, and I've been listening in here for hours um, as senators have given their contributions, the point behind this bill is we've Australians have been waiting for a decade to get wages moving, and we have seen hour after hour in the committee stage of this debate of the coalition refusing, and we know it was a deliberate design feature of their economic architecture, refusing to support new regulation and legislation that will allow the Australian workers to get reasonable wage outcomes, to fix a broken bargaining system, to put gender equality at the heart of our industrial relations legislation, to implement the Respect at Work report that the former government refused to act on, to place job security at the heart of the workplace relations system. The changes and the, the legislation that we are debating tonight will reinvigorate the bargaining system by making it easier for businesses and workers to reach agreement with higher wages and productivity improvements. All of the international evidence shows that when you have effective uh, bargaining arrangements in place supported by legislation, that you will see the benefits flow through wages and through productivity improvements, and that is the kind of economy we want to see working for Australian workers and for Australian businesses. Only about 15 per cent of workers are covered by interim enterprise agreements at the moment. That has to change. That has to be part of the story of why we have seen a decade of wage stagnation. We know that it was part of the economic uh, policy of the former government to make sure that wages were, were suppressed. That, that wage stagnation became a feature of our economic architecture. But this government has made no secret. We made it very clear during the election campaign that we wanted to get wages moving, that we wanted to support particular minimum wage claims, which we did. Remember the Prime Minister saying when, when you all thought 
You've got a moment when he said, absolutely, I want to see wages moving. Absolutely. And that is what the Australian people wanted to see, because our agenda was endorsed in May. And we, when elected, we got in place, we changed the submission going to the Fair Work Commission on low wage, on the minimum wage case. When you were in government, you had a whole section about the importance of low paid jobs. That's, you had a whole section year after year you used to submit to the Fair Work Commission. Well, yeah, have a look at the minimum wage case, but you know there's some really good arguments why you keep wages low. Well, we have a different view to that, and we are ensuring that we are creating an industrial relations system that works for business, that works for those low paid industries that, where bargaining has failed them, those feminised industries, the care economy that is going to be so important to the strength of our economy in years to come. We know the services sector is going to be a key part of the jobs growth of the future, and we have to make sure we are dealing with the wages and conditions in those sectors. It's no good to have all of those workers suffering under poor wage outcomes and poor conditions. That is the point of this, job, this bill. That is the reason why we have sat here for hours on end debating this, arguing for this. We on this side supporting this, challenging your arguments, disagreeing with them, because this is exactly the legislation that Australia needs to make sure that working people get appropriate remuneration and recognition for the work they do and that businesses can thrive and innovate and productivity can be part of the economic conversation once again. The question is that the question be put. All those in favour say aye. All those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. Oh, do I have to go and join them? Probably do at some point. Nobody comes.
Lock the doors. The question is that the question be put. Those for the question move to the right of the chair. Noes to the left of the chair. I appoint teller for the ayes, Senator Urquhart. Teller for the noes, Senator O'Sullivan. One How many? 34. 34. No, I've got 34 still in your side twice, and I told Andrew, and he believed me. Honourable Senators, there being 34 ayes and 32 noes, it's resolved in the affirmative. The question is now that the amendments on sheet 1773, 1 to 6, be agreed to. Those for the question say aye. aye. Against no. no. I think the noes have it. Aye. Division required. How long do you wish to division? One minute. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. Question before the chair is that the amendments on sheet 1773, numbered 1 to 6, be agreed to. Those for the question pass to the right of the chair, noes to the left of the chair. I appoint a teller for the ayes, Senator O'Sullivan, teller for the noes, Senator Urquhart. One teller.
Honourable Senators, there being 31 ayes and 35 noes, it's passed in the negative. I intend to put the final questions, unless any other one, member has a contribution. I put the question. The question is now that the bill, as amended, be agreed to. Those for the question say aye. aye. Against no, the ayes aye. have it. The noes have it. A division required? Vision required. How long do you wish the bells to ring for? One minute. Ring the bells for one minute. Thank you, Senator McKim. Dr Dawes, the question before the committee is that the bill as amended be agreed to. Those for the question pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint a teller for the ayes, Senator Urquhart, teller for the noes, Senator O'Sullivan.
Honourable Senators, there being 35 ayes and 31 noes, it's resolved in the affirmative. The next question is that the, that the bill be reported. Those for the question say aye. aye. Against, no. The ayes have it. Has considered the Fair Work Legislation Amendment, Secure Jobs, Better Pay Bill 2022, and agreed to it with amendments. Uh, Minister, you're seeking the call. Uh, I move the report of the committee Order. be adopted. The question is that the uh, motion is moved by. Senator Chisholm be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Against? No. I believe the ayes have it. The ayes have Division acquired. Ring the bells for one minute. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. So the question is that the report be adopted. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the nose to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the ayes and Senator O'Sullivan as teller for the nose. Order, there being 35 ayes and 31 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. Order, 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 we are not there yet. I'm calling order, order, order. Senator Chisholm. I move the bill now be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Against? No. 
Division required. Yeah. Ring the bell for one minute. Lock the doors. So the question is uh, that the bills be read a third time. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the ayes and Senator O'Sullivan as teller for the noes. Order. There being 35 ayes and 31 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to abolish Order. the Registered Organisations Commission and the Australian Building and Construction Commission and to amend the law relating to workplace relations and workers' compensation and rehabilitation and for related purposes. I call the clerk. Government business order of the day number two. Ozone protection and synthetic greenhouse gas management reform closing the hole in the ozone layer bill 2022 and two related bills. Second reading debate. Minister uh, Senator Dunham. And it's a delight to be able to make a contribution on this very important <laughs> debate on this very important bill. And uh, I just wanted to uh, make sure that my views were fully expressed to the fullest of their possible extent. So I won't have much to say, and I am drawing near the end of my in-depth analysis of this legislation right now. And I would like to commend these bills to the Senate. Thank you, Senator Dunian. Minister. I commend the bill to the Senate. Oh, well done. The question yeah. is that the bill be now read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. Call the clerk. Ozone protection and synthetic greenhouse gas management reform closing the hole in the ozone layer bill 2022. <laughs> ozone protection and synthetic greenhouse gas import levy amendment bill 2022. Ozone protection and synthetic greenhouse gas manufacture levy amendment bill 2022. 
No amendments have been circulated. Does any senator require a committee stage? If not, I shall call the minister to move the third reading. Minister. I move that the bill be read a third time. So the question is that the bills be now read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. The ayes have it. I call the clerk. Ozone Protection and Synthetic Greenhouse Gas Management Reform Closing the Hole on the Ozone Layer Bill 2022. Ozone Protection and Synthetic Greenhouse Gas Import Levy Amendment Bill 2022. Ozone Protection and Synthetic Greenhouse Gas Manufacture Levy Amendment Bill 2022. I call a message. <clears throat> a message has been received from the House of Representatives forwarding a resolution agreed to by that House to refer a matter to the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters for Inquiry and Report. The text of the resolution is available on the dynamic red. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Broadcasting Services Amendment Community Radio Bill 2022 for concurrence. I call the Minister. The bill be, may proceed without formalities be now read a first time. Uh, the question is that the motion is moved by the Minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Broadcasting Services Act 1992 and for related purposes. Minister. Thank you. I move that this bill be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Is Thanks, leave Wally. granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Minister. Um, Senator Henderson. Thank you very much, Madam President. I commend this bill to the, to the Senate. Thank you, Minister. I also commend this bill to the Senate. I thank the Senate for their support. The question is that the bill be now read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Broadcasting Services Act 1992 and for related purposes. No amendments have been circulated. Does any senator require a committee stage? If not, I shall call the minister to read the bill a third time. Minister. I move that the bill be read a third time. So the question is that the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Broadcasting Services Act 1992 and for related purposes. Order of the day number three, Animal Health Australia and Plant Health Australia Funding Legislation Amendment Bill 2022, second reading debate. Minister. Oh, beg your pardon. The question is that the bills be now read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. No amendments have been circulated. Does any senator require. Oh. Yep. Uh, I'll ask that does, this, does the chamber require the clerk to read the bill a second time? Thank you. No amendments have been circulated. Does any senator require a committee stage? If not, I shall call the minister to move the third reading. Minister. I move that the bill be read a third time. So the question is that the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. Animal Health Australia and Plant Health Australia Funding Legislation Amendment Bill 2022. Senators, we shall now deal with the Financial Sector Reform Bill 2022 in accordance with the order agreed to. At a second reading speech for the Animal Health and Plant Bill, and I was standing. Sorry, Senator Mackenzie. I was standing. We've just. Senator Hanson Young will confirm that I was standing on my feet when you read that bill out. You didn't look up and I was standing. Uh, Senator Hanson Young. Um, uh, thank you, Madam President. I did see um, I'm being very gracious. I did see uh, Senator Mackenzie on her feet. However, I do think it was at the wrong point. However, earlier in this fortnight, um, mm. uh, we already had given leave for a member to incorporate their second reading speech out of that session, and I su suggest we do the same thing for Senator Mackenzie. 
Uh, Senator McKenzie, um, the suggestion has been made that your speech is incorporated. Chair, I rose when you read out the clerk Senator read out McKenzie. the bill, and I would like to make my contribution. So, uh, Senator Rustin, um, Senator McKenzie uh, has raised a point of order that she was on. Oh, sorry. So, uh, the yes. So, the Animal Health Australia and Plant Health Australia funding. We've just done the third reading. I was just checking whether we did a second reading on it. I heard you read out the title of the bill, yeah. and then it didn't something. We didn't we skip the second reading? going to have to review because I had advice that sure. we weren't that we were up to the second reading, yeah, which is why I jumped when yeah. I did, Chair. Senator McKenzie, we've had a very long day um, and we've had long sittings this week. And if we've made a mistake, then I apologise. We're all doing our best. The offer's been made for you to incorporate the speech, and you've indicated you're happy with that. Thank you, Senator McKenzie. Senator Rustin. Um, could I seek the guidance of the chamber? Um, I would like to seek leave to make a very short contribution in relation to the bill that's under um, the orders um, of uh, the amendment that Senator Gallagher put to the orders, which is uh, um, in relation to the uh, financial uh, accountability regime act. So I'm just wondering if I would seek leave to be able to make a short statement before we move into those orders. Uh, Thank you, Minister. Sorry, just on that, um, as I understand it, the motion passed earlier by the Senate today um, it has this bill as part of a guillotine. So there's a series of questions that are just being put, and it doesn't allow for contributions on the bill. Uh, Senator Rustin? Yeah, I was seeking leave to be able to make a short contribution before we moved into that guillotine order. That was all. A very short one. Yeah, one minute. Um, you've been given one, one minute. Thanks, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much. The coalition will not stand in the way of this bill passing. However, we have to note for the record our deep concerns about the process around the bill. For the second week in a row, we've seen the government fly a kite on finalising the legislation to implement the recommendations of the Financial Services Royal Commission. As yet, for the second week in a row, we have seen a mad scramble, a deal with Greens and a failure to deliver certainty to our financial institutions. Tonight, the government are gutting their own bill. This is a broken promise from the government that promised to be collaborative, that promised to be pro-business, that promised to be, provide stability. We still have several unanswered questions from the government about the operation of this legislation. The inquiry into this bill acknowledged the potential consequences of the consumer credit reforms on small businesses in the sector and to low-income Australians' access to credit. It is critical the government get the regulations associated with this bill right and do not set protected earnings amounts that will leave businesses closing and consumers worse off in managing their financial affairs. Thank you, Senator Rustin. Senators, we will now deal with the Financial Sector Reform Bill 2022 in accordance with the order agreed earlier to today. The question is that the bill be now read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I'll call the clerk. A bill for an act to deal with consequential amendments and transitional matters arising from the enactment of the Financial Accountability Regime Act 2022 to establish the financial services compensation scheme of last resort to amend the National Consumer Credit Protection Act 2009 and for related purposes. Thank you. I will now deal with the amendments circulated by the government on sheets PM145 and PM146. I understand the minister has documents to table. I call the minister. Thank you, President. I table supplementary explanatory memoranda relating to the government amendments to the bill. Thank you. The question is that schedules one, two and three stand, stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? No. I believe that I'm going to put the question again. 
The question is that schedules one, two and three stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Aye. I believe the noes have it. The question now is that the remaining amendments on sheets PM145 and PM146 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. The question now is that the remaining stages of the bill be agreed to and the bill be now passed with amendments to the title. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the National Consumer Credit Protection Act 2009 and for related purposes. Senators, that concludes consideration of the bills. Minister. Uh, I move that the Senate at its rising adjourn till Monday the 6th of February 2023 at 10 a.m. or such other time as may be fixed by the President or in the event of the President being unavailable by the Deputy President and that the time of meeting so determined shall be notified to each senator and leave of absence be granted to every member of the Senate from the end of the sitting day to the day on which the Senate next meets. So the question is, the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. The Senate stands adjourned.